Welcome everyone to Voices with Perveki. I'm very excited about this. I'm joined with uh, by Guy Sensbach and Zevi Slavin, and we're going to do another one of these things like uh, Zevi and I did, where we're going to have a series of uh, discussions, and they're going to move between the various channels. We'll start on my channel, and we'll move to Guy, and then we'll move to, uh, to Zevi. Um, and we, we don't know how many times we're going to end up circling because we're, we're, we, we've got this uh, very, uh, we can see how excited I am. We got this very uh, mm -hmm. uh, large topic where we want to uh, wrestle with in a good way. And so the topic uh, we are uh, going to do is the title of the series indicates is we're going to explore the relationship uh, between dialogos and a, 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 as an event in which people participate and mystical experience or mystical realization is a better way of putting it as again, an event in which people participate. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a, a pivotal figure here. Now I want to be clear for everybody. Th this is not, we're not doing an exegetical exercise. We'll do exegesis, but we're going to use Martin Buber as a foil. We're ultimately interested in what's the relationship between these two phenomena? What's the relationship between uh, two phenomena? What's the relationship between dialogos, participation in dialogos and participation in mystical realization? Now, Buber is a useful figure uh, to use as a, uh, as a philosophical foil uh, for two important reasons. He is an, a pivotal figure. It, it, like he's had a huge influence on me. I know he's influenced a uh, guy on this. He's a huge influence, a pivotal figure on what I call dialogos. And we'll talk a bit about what that is as, uh, as this unfolds and, and, and how Buber's work has influenced, uh, uh, well, my work and guys work on dialogos. Right? But Buber is very interesting because he, he initially starts his life um, and he's very enamored with what he called mystical experience. Um, and we're gonna talk about what that means. And then he has what he calls basically like an, a conversion event. And for him, it's as deep and profound as a religious conversion in which he turned away from mysticism and turned into his dialogical practice. And so, and so he seems to see dialogos and mystical realization as opposite to each other and, 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 and there being you know, conflict or a need to choose one exhaustively and exclusively over the other. Um, and, and for me, I find, although I, like I, as I said, I'm, I deeply appreciate Buber, I find that a perplexing claim. Um, and let's make clear, it's not a theoretical claim on his part. It's an autobiographical existential claim, right? He, 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 it was such a pivotal event for him. He transformed his life around it. Here's why, there's two primary reasons why I find it difficult. And we're going to unpack these. Um, the one is, I, I am aware of another tradition, the Platonic and Neoplatonic traditions, in which dialogos and mystical realization are completely interdependent and interdefining in a profound way. And so it's like, how, how can one tradition see them as so profound and another, at least another particular individual, I'm not claiming that Buber speaks for all of Ju the Jewish spirituality or anything ridiculous like that, but how can, how can, like, can we, can we get these two into dialogue, pun intended, uh, such that we can understand, well, what's being said here uh, and what's going on? Yeah. The other reason why I find it perplexing that Buber sees such a radical opposition between the logos and mystical realization is because when, you, when, I, when I'm reading Buber, and you have to read Buber in a particular way, we'll talk about this later, it's very much like Lexio Divina, for those of you who've seen some of my other work, it's clear that there are aspects in his work that are, to my mind, properly described as mystical. There's, yeah. uh, we, we get into a, a relationship that is, in some sense, beyond speech, God, and God isn't a thing. Uh, that's clearly the case. Uh, God is, the, by, uh, and you'll, this will make a little bit more sense in a few minutes, God is a thou that can never become an it. And that seems to defy all categorization. And yet, so we're in this deep relationship with something that transcends speech and conceptualization. And why isn't that a mystical realization? And it, and it calls the person to their true self. Um, so 
many people read Buber, uh, and, uh, and I think if they, especially if they're not aware of his biography, they get a very mystical reading off of Buber. I, and I don't think that is an in, inappropriate, uh, irresponsible response to Buber's text. So there's a lot of tension here. Now, again, this is not exegetical. The point we're after here ultimately is what's the relationship between dialogos and mystical realization? Now, we're each going to take a different dimension. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll let, uh, I'll introduce them at uh, my two, my two friends. That's the best way to describe them, especially in what we're going to do, uh, right? Um, but we're each gonna take a role. Uh, don't reduce us to this role. This is for the drama of the dialogos. I'm gonna represent the rational dimension uh, because I'm very interested in what I call the voice of reason. And I don't think of reason as just logic, right? How is it that, and this is what the Neoplatonic tradition see, somehow in dialogos, we attune to the voice of reason until we pass beyond argumentation to that unity, that, rea that realization of what is really real, that reason is ultimately in love with and ultimately seeking. So that's the rational. I'm interested in the voice of reason. So I'll, I'll represent the rational dimension. Guy, who is one of the founding figures and ongoing supporters and promoters of circling, has devoted decades then, right, to cultivating uh, a practice that properly homes the, the dialogical as a yeah, way of trying that. to understand um, the Heideggerian call to this way of thinking and being with each other. And some of you, and you've seen me and uh, Guy be in deep dialogue. And Zevi and I, um, uh, you've also seen, have had this amazing joint series on mysticism. And so Zevi's gonna represent the mystical dimension uh, and between us, we're gonna try and realize what's the relationship between the rational, the dialogical and the mystical. So now I'm gonna stop talking for a bit. We'll come back in a bit and I'll sort of set up some introdu introductory ideas around Buber, but I'd like, uh, I'd like for Guy to, to take some time to introduce himself. What's his take on this? How is he, how is he going to embody his role and enter into yeah. this? And then after him, uh, Zevi. So take it away, Guy. Yeah, my name's Guy Sengstock. Um, to be truly Buberian, that is to be spoken as one one word. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm I, I have been deeply into both Heidegger and Buber, and uh, in, 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 it's, in, in kind of preparing for this dialogue, I really had no idea what a what a strange relationship Buber had with many of the philosophers, right? And and theologians, right? There, there was really some tensions going on there. And so I've been noticing, I've been walking around kind of all week with these kind of arguments in my head, going back and forth and thinking about them more than I'd ever really understood because I've never really looked at Buber from a, from a comparative aspect. But I think he brings up some real deep points about a particular mode of nihilism that he was responding to. Um, and I think that we got to, I think we've got to kind of like look at, you know, we'll talk, we'll, we'll get into this more, but we need to look at like this sense of the, the immediacy of the real and the encounter, that particular numbness of abstraction, right? And homelessness that comes with part of nihilism. And I think that's that he was specifically um, in, in some sense, a, in response to that dimension of it, right? So I think there's been some confusion around interpretations and stuff around around that. Um, and I'm, I'm also excited about this too, because John and I are going to be doing a, and we'll put all, all the, uh, the links for this in the show notes, but John and I are going to be doing a, um, an experiential course on dialogos and, 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 the, and the dialogical, right? Um, and, and circling, the combination of the two. We're going to bring them together. It's going to be a real experiential thing. So we'll, uh, links for that, if you want to join, join in that course, that's going to be the 24th uh, uh 24th and 25th i believe yes, that's right um yeah 10 uh 10 a.m till 4 p.m pacific standard time so i'm just excited to be in the flow and i've enjoyed i've enjoyed um i, I i've en i've totally enjoyed getting to to know you a little bit so far Zeev, and in all of your work and uh 
and am appreciating the rigor and the openness that you come to this conversation with. Yeah, it's a pleasure to join this conversation amongst, as appropriately John said, friends. I thought the the word which may have been coming was was panelists or uh, <laughs> dialogues, but friends is really the right word and also the right spirit to approach Buber. I and mean, as I've also been, you know, looking back on some Buber and looking back at a man who I fell in love with in my early twenties, um, it's he's really kind of rekindled me to 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 look at the world. And John will explain what these terms mean, but to look at the world through the I thou lenses, and and that's been a really beautiful experience. And to come to this conversation to see both John and Guy as as thou's, as, as used in, in a full being, is, is also a gift from Buber in many senses. So it's that, that I, I, I held a debt of gratitude to him. I grew up in the Hasidic tradition, uh, for those that don't know a bit about my story, and I began to explore a bit more broadly mysticism as a universal topic beyond just Hasidic mysticism or Jewish mysticism, which can be done quite parochially. Um, and Buber, Martin Buber, along with Avram Yeshua Heschel, a contemporary of his, were the first really authors that I read outside of the immediate canon mm. of my own sect's literature. Um, and and the, the poetry, the, the depth of feeling, the pathos, the prophetic spirit, which they both embodied, the philosophy. So Buber, for me, this, this character who introduced me to, to a new way of thinking about my own tradition, to think about it in existential tones, um, in, in, in realizable, in real tones, is something which which I'm still very much deeply influenced by. I hold my own personal grudges, perhaps, that he transitioned from the mystical to the dialogical. Um, <laughs> and uh, no, that's a joke. I, and I, and I, I hope to explore <laughs> that, that, that tension between them. It's um, yeah, I'm 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 very excited to be here, and, and I'm very excited to to both learn about this character together with you, Guy and uh, John and Guy, and also to to be able to 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 experience to exemplify what Buber was trying to get at with his work, um, which he constantly reiterated that it was not about abstractions and not about ideas, but it was about real uh, people and real experiences and being open to the, to the shiftingness of reality and being open to the real presence that each moment brings. So I'm going to try and be present and try and embody that call from Buber. And uh, thank you so much for having me on, John and Guy. Yeah. You're welcome. And I'm concerned that I've been mispronouncing your, your name. Have I been mispronouncing your name? Um, no, so Zavi is uh, is Zavi's pretty right. easy. Okay, yeah. it's okay. Zavi. Mm -hmm. yeah. So some basic ideas about Uber, and, um, and and this is not going to be complete or exhaustive. It's introductory. It's to get us into discussion. So the primary idea about Uber is, uh, and what makes him properly an existentialist, I would say is that he prioritizes in a profound way, more than other existentialists, the existential, uh, existential modes. So what's an existential mode? An existential mode is one in which the relationship between you and the world, and I'm trying to leave these very vague right now, is primary. Um, and one of the main ideas from Martin Buber, uh, sorry, from Martin Heidegger, that Buber uh, was influenced by, is this, this fundamental being in the world um, that uh, what Heidegger called, called Dasein. So Dasein isn't a property of you. It isn't a property of the world. And this is what, why Heidegger was so interested in it. It's, a, it's, it's about a fundamental grounding connection between you and the world, uh, being there. Um, that's why he, he, he puts the two together. So uh, one way I've tried to talk about this uh, that helps sort of link it to some cog sci is the idea of the co-identification relationship between the agent and the arena. I'm always assuming an identity as I'm assigning identities to things. I'm becoming right now I'm becoming you know the the, the professional cognitive scientist or whatever I'm role I'm assuming right now and then I'm assigning identities and, and, and you know and they, they can be good identities. These are my friends. Um, and my interlocutors, right? That's very different existential mode than when I'm with my beloved and I assume the role of a lover and assign the identity of beloved. And, the, and, and so we have to understand that these modes are primary. And this is the thing that Buber elevates in a way 
beyond even what Heidegger does, to my mind. Buber actually says, no, no, that, that relatedness, that connectedness of co-identification is primary. And he talks about two modes and two primary modes that are understood and he describes them relationally. So the first is the I-thou relationship. And I think it's helpful, it, they're not identical, but it's helpful to compare this to Eric Fromm's being mode. So in the I-thou mode, you can, I, I, again, our, our language is gonna be difficult here because our language tends to orient us towards the agent and then predicate it out in an Aristotelian fashion. And it's exactly that Aristotelian logic that Buber is trying to break us free from. Okay, so try to, please, I ask everybody to be charitable. I'm tr uh, my language is going to bedevil me to, to a degree, perhaps all of us, but I can only apologize for myself. Um, so, mm -hmm. right, so when I find myself par participating, and I'm gonna try and use this word participating as breaking out of the two ways we understand the agent. The agent either acts or passively receives. And participation is neither action nor re reception. It, 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 it encompasses, but is in deeper than both of them. So I participate in an I-thou relationship. In an I-thou relationship, what happens is, what's key is I'm, and I wanna use the notion here from Don Wright is what I'll call, what he calls sensibility transcendence. Sensibility transcendence is this bi-directional move in which I am trying to be open, uh, there's a reciprocal opening. I'm trying to open up to you in your unique suchness. That about you, which is non-categorical, cannot be put into categories. And I'm trying to, and this is why I'm participating in, at the same time, I, I'm reciprocally opening, I'm allowing my suchness to come. To, what is it, about, you know, John Verveke, and even the name is, in some sense categorical, but this, right, this here now with this history back there is can, can, can be here in this world in a way nothing else can. And that suchness is trying to reciprocally open to the suchness of another. And he calls that I thou, because if you, when, when you say thou to somebody, and we're gonna, I, I suggest we use the archaic word. I think Kaufman's translation into you loses something. Thou carries with yeah. it that you're you're direct you're you're directing reverence to another right another person. It doesn't have to be a person. We'll come back to that. But it's a personal reverence that you are uh, directing. You and, and so Wright talks about this uh, on an idea derived from Iris Murdoch. Right, and Murdoch gives the example. Of, Here's a daughter, or here's a mother-in-law, and she doesn't like her daughter-in-law because she thinks her daughter-in-law is very coarse and crude. And then she realizes that she has not properly understood certain phenomena. Her categories are inadequate. And she gives up, right, you know, crudeness and coarseness and sees the daughter as spontaneous and grounded. So you notice what's happening? She is letting go of her categories to, and, and allowing her consciousness and her cognition to be tailored, well-fitted to what that daughter-in-law is. It's a way of reverence and giving, doing due justice and due respect to the suchness of another person. So that's an I-thou relationship. And you're completely in the being mode, uh, to use a Fromian sense. You're not trying to manipulate or control. You are trying to uh, develop uh, uh, your personhood. <laughs> Now, Buber has another term, another, right? And remember, the relationship is I it. And this, this maps really well, I think, under Fromm's having. In the I it relationship, my attitude towards things is their categorical identity. This is a book, this is a poem, right? And what's the point of the category? The, categor the point of the category is to help me see how that thing is like a bunch of other things so that I can take a skill that and, and, and apply it equally and powerfully to any of those members in an interchangeable manner. So the point of that is right to get control because I do need to control the world. If I don't control the world, then there, uh, then I can't uh, I can't have certain things. I need to have food. I need to have water. I need to have sleep. Right. I need to have a safe environment. So 
don't think of this as bad, but the point is I, I, I manipulate the world because I'm trying to solve problems that are needed to be solved by controlling things. In the I-thou relationship, I'm not trying to solve problems. So I'm not curious about how to manipulate things. I'm trying to open up the identity of things. I'm trying to wonder. I'm trying to wonder. And for me, that's the connection to the Platonic tradition because Socrates says that wisdom begins in wonder. Now, for Buber, again, it's don't think he, he don't think of this as evil, the ayat, the I thou is good, uh, uh, because we have to do we have to spend a lot of time in ayat. The thing he's worried about, and again, this is similar in some ways to Palm's modal confusion, is that we've lost, we, we tend to lose the difference. Because what happens is once we lose, I don't know what to call it right now, once we lose the muse, the magic of the logos and enter back into our everyday lives, he says the I thou relationships always degenerate into I it. So you're with your beloved, I thou relationship, right? but you're away and you're not in that moment anymore. And then there's a tendency to just think of, for me, think of her as my girlfriend. It, you know, and that's not false and it's not wrong, but notice what I've done. I've just, I've categorized her and, and, and notice the mistake if I were to bring this into the moment with her, the, the presence of her and treat her categorically. Well, you know, I, I would say to her, you know, you remind me of all the other women I've been with. You're in that category very well. I can manipulate you and I can have you as much as I need. That's the end of that relationship. So notice the, the point is, of course, I will fall into ayat thought. That's inevitable. Buber isn't condemning people for that. What he's criticizing is that people, we do, this happens inevitably. We go from ayat to ayat, but we forget to do the return. We forget to cultivate a practice where we return from the ayat to the I thou. And so his, his philosophy, I, I don't know what to call it, but that's what I'm gonna call it, 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 at least in the sense of the love of wisdom, his philosophy is largely about how do we, how do we return? How do we, how do we practice presencing and reciprocally opening with each other to the, when we return? Okay, I'm gonna say a few more things and then that will be the introduction. But uh, both of my friends are nodding, so it seems like I'm, I'm doing an okay job. So Buber talks about, um, so we, we have this, he may, remember he makes the relation primary. I would even ultimately argue ontologically primary, but we can come back to that. And he sees that there are four relational realms. Now what's interesting, there's four realms in which we can be in I, thou, or I, it relation. And these are, sort of the four dimensions of our humanity. He originally had three, and in the, if you get the book, I Thou, you can, get, you can get translations which are only three, but later on, I think it was in the 50s, he added a postscript in which he added the fourth, and then he talked about that in another essay. Now, I, I think a really good presentation, for those of you who are interested, is, is this book by Kramer. He's also got a more, a, a more recent book that's sort of a, a, a more of a practice book. This is sort of a theory into practice, and then the other book is focused on practice. And I'll hold that up at some point uh, in a series. And he talks, and he he lays out a really nice schema. For those of you who get the book, it's on page 65. <clears throat> he lays out a really nice schema for understanding this, these relational realms. And I wanna go through this schema very carefully. Um, and, and so these are the four relational realms. These are the realms in which dialogos is realizable for us. So the first is in nature. Now that might strike people as odd because surely dialogue, dialogus depends on dialogue. If what we mean by dialogue is speech, Luber's saying, no, no, dialogus is possible without speech. And, and, it's, and, and we're gonna talk about this. He, he, how, how do you relate to a tree as a thou? And what does that mean? What does that mean? And so we'll come back to that. Now, it's interesting. And I think Kramer is right about this. Buber defines these realms Right, not only in terms of their possibility from the, for these two types of uh, relational ways of being, but also in relation to speech. And notice how that already came up. So he says that the 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 the, the, the realm the relate the, the the realm of nature, the relational realm of nature, is 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 beneath speech. So it, it, it's tapping into something about us, and I I want to eventually talk about that as the procedural and the perspectival and things like that. It's it's this. Right, it's beneath speech, and then he used Buber uses this really uh, tricky German 
two word phrase. And if you look through the translations, it's maddening because it's translated as intellectual form, spiritual shape. <laughs> um, but I like Kramer's proposal for the translation uh, because, uh, but, but I still want to qualify it. He, 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 he translates it as spirit becoming form. Now let's stop there because he's using the German, he's using the word German word Geist. And the problem with the German word Geist is it, it doesn't really translate well as spirit. It's, it's, it translates as spirit, right? But it's not just spirit because it also translates as mind. It can even translate as intellect in, in certain situations. That's why some people translate it as intellectual form, right? And also form is meant very platonically, which I'm, that might irk Uber, I'm not sure. But what he means is he means that which makes things intelligible and, and also that which makes them be what they are. Like, right, and so this spirit coming into form. An example he gives, uh, Buber get, relates this experience where he's looking at a particular wall, and there's like, like in its there's architecture. It's been designed a particular way, and he's suddenly struck by the artistry of the wall. He's struck by how that form ha has now inspirited the wall. And I don't mean anything goopy or California by that. What I mean is. You get a sense of right. The, 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 there's it's like what Scari talks about when she talks about the be when you get that moment of beauty. You get a sense. I didn't realize walls could be like this. And, and wow, how did that how, that 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 intelligible meaning that was in that person's mind has informed the wall, and I'm relating to it. So that's why I think it's thinking about it as you know, spirit becoming form in, in both in the sense of forming and right and informing um, some material thing is what so for me that's a very platonic notion and uh, right and so that realm so we can enter into that whenever we're in relationship to things like art and later on maybe philosophy but whenever we're coming into what plato would talk about is the contemplation of the forms we can experience uh, we can do i that but we can also do i it the next, so, oh, what's the relationship of speech? Now, interestingly, well, the nature is beneath speech, the realm of, uh, of spirit becoming form is what bequeaths speech. It's what makes speech possible. That's why the connection to intelligibility is so important, right? So because of what's happening in the, in the wall with me and me with the wall, Right, the wall had the wall, the wall and I are shaping each other in such a way that speech is possible for me about the wall, but it doesn't mean the wall is speaking to me. So he's not being sort of crypto animist or anything like that. Okay, the next one, which is properly in speech, is the person-to-person -person relation. Okay, and that is primary in, in some ways, in some ways for Buber, but in other ways it's not primary. Because you can make an argument that the fourth realm is ultimately the primary one. And this is, again, for me, strikes very uh, Neoplatonic. And, and Kramer lays, lays it out in that order, I think, which is rather nice. So this is the relationship to what Buber calls the eternal vow, God. And the point about this is right? It is a separate realm. It's not the same relational being as we, now, we can get into dialogos in all of these, but right, there, there's something different, right? And, and, and that, that difference is captured in the difference of our relationship to speech. Nature is below speech, right? Spirit becoming form, the intelligible forms, bequeath or make speech possible. We actually engage in speech with other persons, but with the internal thou, although we can speak, uh, what he says is it actually transcends and penetrates speech, right? So it, 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 if you'll allow me to use a bit of the spatial metaphor, if nature is below speech, God is in, in some way above speech, but penetrating speech from above. God's not, not separated in that aboveness, if you'll allow me. Right? Now, what's unique about this 
is this is the one realm in which you can't enter into an I it relation. Now we have to be really careful about what he means because you can say, well, surely I can think of God as a thing and I want to manipulate God in prayer. And he doesn't deny any of that. What he means though, is you can't get it. You, you're, you're not in any kind of proper relationship to it. Um, you, you are, you are, you are fundamentally mistaken about it. If you take the I it relationship with it, in a way, you're not fundamentally relate, mistaken if I use this just in an I it relationship. Seeing it always and only as I it is a mistake, but taking it as an it is not a mistake. But for God, it is, it is always a mistake to try and get into an I it relationship. Now, for me, notice, the, notice how three of these realms are outside speech. And one of them is outside categorical thought, the dialogical relationship with God. And God somehow transcends spirit coming into form, which, I mean, th th that sounds incredibly neoplatonic to me. And it, it, it sounds incredibly mystical to me, beyond speech, beyond thought. But that's just to set up the problem we're going to discuss. So I hope that's, I mean, that was fast, and I didn't want to do too much, but I try, I wanted to give us at least some basic theoretical machinery for talking about Hoover. So I'll stop talking and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let, uh, I'll let my, ge my gentleman friend uh, begin. So who wants to riff and respond on that? See, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still working with this, this last thing that you said, <laughs> right, about this what is that relation, right? What is that relation? Because in some sense with Buber, I mean, in some sense, God is, God is underneath and within all of it, isn't it? It's like, it's like God is the ultimate the thou, right? Yeah. yeah, it's the ultimate God. And, and the thing I'm, I, I found interesting as, I, as I've been rereading Buber again is that in some sense, it's almost like the I thou relation right is this way where you have this in the way he describes it, i kept getting this sense that it's and this is where we can start to look at dialogos right and this lifting right where we got where where you're not just with yeah. the product of the logos right conversing it but you actually you read so deeply into it that you become identified with the logos in some sense right yes yes um yeah. And that precisely, you really get this sense that he's talking about the, 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 that fundamental relation, the I, thou, as being spoken as one word, right? Especially that, that sense of it, you know, it, it, where, and also this quality where everything, it's almost as if the whole universe both comes to a single point. It's like the one in the many, right? It, get experienced in this in this dialogue but in this strange way that's not a it's not it's not objective so there's like all kinds of interesting things here the other thing i kind of noticed about buber is I, and i and i'm curious about this because as as i was reading more of the people that critiqued him and his response to to, to them yeah i kept getting a sense i kept wondering about like some of his responses were kind of non-responses right and I kept getting the sense that he was exemplifying something through all of it, right? That he was in, similar to Socrates, right? Um, where Socrates would be, you know, would be talking about how he doesn't know what love is and or, or, or whatever, but yes. he's actually um, aporically embodying the good that can't be spoken, be, but, but he's being it, right, in some sense. I kept noticing that Buber seem to respond right to some of these criticisms right uh in a way that seemed to exemplify the thou and and not hitting something right so even his vagueness seemed to i'm not sure about this but they seem to be he seemed to be kind of like in response to the philosophy which he really saw is and i think he's mostly responding to modernism right um as as that as that overly abstract, 
right? And not and leaving it out, right? The way the way that Kierkegaard talked about Hegel, right? Where it's like, yeah, they build these cat, you know, these castles, and then they live in the shack next to it, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> they, they they don't include them. They live near it, but they don't live. They they're not within their system, right? And he, and I think in that same vein that Kierkegaard first started talking about, right? Mm. Um, with the is that he's he's kind of in that same vein all the way all the way through so yeah so that's that's just some of my initial responses to what, what i was what i was left with but this kind of sense where there's this one that like the the one in the many in this dialogue this dialogical yeah. relation yeah. which is just yeah. actually really compelling it's very platonic yeah i, I want to pick up right on that me. at some point I, I really do because i think that there's two transcendences at work here. There's the sensibility transcendence that Wright talks about, and then there's the intellective transcendence that you get in the Neoplatonic tradition. And I think there, there, there's a proper relationship between them as well. Uh, I remember, uh, I, 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 I've been going through Alexio Divina with Spinoza, and I was just floored by this part where he says, God, God does not have any abstract ideas. And it was like, and I read it before, and then it just sort of hit me like, right, so we, we, we have to do this Sort of abstraction perhaps like with spinoza to get up there but once we're there we have to we have to get we, we have to revow it because it's not yeah. it's not in any way an abstraction and it was that i remember that sort mm -hmm. of it, i almost felt physically pushed back when i read that it was like oh and yeah so i want to talk about the the one and the many mm -hmm. or sensibility transcendence and intellective transcendence um and 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 again what does that have to do with abstraction and and, yeah. and reason but I want to hear what yeah. Zevi has to say. Yeah, I'm really excited with the direction that this is taking. I'm really, I'm really curious uh, to see what to see where it goes and where the life of it takes itself. But just before moving forward, just to reflect on two things that John you had said. Um, one is the, the there's this issue of the thou you that the translator has a problem. Yeah, yeah. Miss iron thou and thou ultimately wins out. And you mentioned Kaufman's struggling with which is the correct translation. And Coffin makes the interesting point, which I think is worth bringing up here, which is that thou, because it's archaic in contemporary English, ah. it, have, it, it has a lot of respect, as you say it. Um, and I think you correctly emphasize that respect, but I want to, I want to maybe just nuance it a little for the audience. And, and, and you'll, you'll correct me if I'm, if I'm misrepresenting what you're saying. No, no. I think what, what, what Buber, what Buber is getting at with his, with his, with his do is not respect in the sense that we think of respect, like respect your elders or respect an authority. Yeah, yeah. Um, because in German, you have a word for that. You have Z is, is what you yeah, talk yeah, about yeah, in yeah, sense of respect. Yeah. Du is, is deeply personal. It's yeah. intimate. And that's what he was getting at. It. And it's respect in the sense of the awe that you have in the, in the immense um, sui generis personality of something which breaks all categorization. Yes. So yeah. when, I just want to be, I, I want to, if I can make that point that when we say respect- I think that's an excellent, uh, excellent, yes, mm -hmm. yes. So that's so that's one thing, um, and 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 I think it's fascinating to to think about for Buber, it's 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 that which it's which definitionally is not quantifiable and measurable, but he says you know it when you do it, and I think I think that we all can know that what, we, what we're struggling here is we're struggling to to use language to define that which is the I thou which is that which is does not fit into language, yeah, uh, yeah. which is why Buber, which is part of the critique against Buber as Guy was mentioning a lot of people criticize him for being just you know, for obfuscating terms, for being too poetic, for not being exact. And Buber's saying, no, like you need the poetry to describe that experience because nothing else quite gets to it. It's, it's poetry which points beyond language to point to that experience, which is more than experience, which is which is the full totality of the other as a real entity and not just as a projection of our own mind, which yeah, is part of yeah. Buber's, you know, escape from from his, um, his earlier, there's this early moment where he's very much redeemed from his own sense that everything is just, you know, the constructs of his imaginations by his reading of Kant and, and for Buber, it's that real, real experience. So I think yeah. that part of the struggle that the audience will language is us trying to talk about this, this place, which is full of awe and full of presence and full of intimacy. And therefore it, it almost must be done poetically or metaphorically. Uh, so that's, that's, that's one point. The other point, which I wanted to mention was that the IU and, and John, you, you got to mention in this, uh, in, in sort of the second half of your presentation, the IU is, is as you said, it's not just with people, um, yeah. And Buber makes this very clear. Buber has IU moments in his book with, with a cat, with a tree, in his early work with a piece of rock, a piece of mica. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, I think, and I think that point is very interesting for our contemporary world, and, and maybe this will come up in the conversation, where we treat the world around us as something for our own exploitation, as a means to an end, 
instead of seeing nature as its own person, its own mm-hmm. persona, which we can encounter the divinity within the thou within that, and therefore we cannot simply uh, exploit it. We cannot simply use it to our own ends. So I think there's there's sort of this anthropomorphization or this divinization of reality. And, and really the, the way I see the I thou, which is what both Guy and John were saying, was to see the divine in everything because the because in every relationship between an I and a thou, the reference is made to the eternal thou to God. God is always implicated in that relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe just to one final point before passing it back, there was a beautiful letter that Martin Luther King Jr., the who I don't think needs not much introduction in his letters from jail, he wrote that that what's needed is that once we can once once all of white America can see the divinity inherent within the African American, then that is the end to, to racism. And I think that in, in all of our John, very much your focus on yeah. on the mini crisis and on the alienation yeah. and on the instrumentization of, of, of things. When we see the divinity, which means simply put, that this thing has inalienable, inherent, infinite value. It's the it's the it's the meaning of the infinity and the actuality in the in the thou in the divinity of that all that we encounter. Um, and and for 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 Buber, that's both with people and nature and animals um, and in the and specifically in the other. And I think I think that what might be an interesting point, which is inevitably going to come up here, is is that it's specifically in the other. It's it's, it's actually in the space between the two. Yes, Buber finds the real magic. Yeah. So that's that's my um, that's my yeah. reflection on, on, on how you guys opened. So I, I mean, there, I wow, that's great. Uh, there, so I, there's, I have two sort of things. Uh, one is I'm, uh, there's a cognitive scientist that's interested in me, and, and then it connects up to uh, some stuff I've read uh, by Robert Carter, who's one of the uh, great uh, interpreters of the Kyoto School uh, to English audiences, uh, mm-hmm. especially uh, Nishitani and Nishida. But he wrote a book, uh, Becoming Bamboo, and there's a Zen thing. If, you know, if you want to learn from the pine, you have to go to the pine, right? Uh, and, and so it, that has a properly poetic thing. And But I've also done, uh, been, I'm publishing papers right now with Dan Chiappi, where you can actually see this and you can see it in cognitive science and you can see it as really, really, so let me describe it very briefly for some of you who are not familiar with it. Because I want to I want to bring out the loop a little bit. Mm-hmm. So the work was on scientists on the ground, NASA scientists moving the rovers around on Mars. Now, it's interesting that one of the rovers is actually called Spirit, by the way. Um, and, and the issue is uh, they don't have, you don't have joy, joystick control, and all you're getting is flat black and white photos, all right, and stuff like this. And, and how do you like? And what's really interesting, and this goes a lot towards Buber because Buber emphasizes presence again and again and again, is this phenomena of presence realization. It's like in, in video games where they, they feel that they are on Mars. And they feel that they're on Mars because they are being the rover. It's just rarely, and, and, you, and what happens is there's this link process, this loop. So first of all, they anthropomorphize the, the rover, right? And, and they'll do things like, and, and they not only anthropomorphize, they identify an anthropomorphizing. Like, I need to move my arm, right? It's the rover. And right, and, and we it would and all those saving, we've got to keep the rover alive, right? And so they anthropomorphize it terrifically. But they also do the reverse. They technomorphize themselves. So what they'll do is like one of the scientists will say, like, oh, oh, here's a rock, and, and she's sitting on a chair, a swivel chair, and she'll start moving around and she'll and she'll go like this. And I I, I need to turn like this, right? And th- these are the these are the rover's cameras and the wheels are right, right? And what happens is there, there's this loop, right? As much as they're anthropomorphizing the rover, right, and turning the rover into a human being, they're allowing themselves to become the rover. So yeah. I'll use some terms from Polanyi, right, and from, from Moloponti. They, they indwell the rover. So when you're indwelling yeah. something, you're not just seeing, you know, like, like when, when I pick up an object and tap, like, right, I mean, dwelling this, I'm not seeing it, I'm seeing through it. So they indwell the rover. They're trying to be the rover and see like the rover sees, but they also internalize the rover. What would it be like to be the rover? What would it be like to be the rover? So there's this loop of internalization and indwelling. And what that gives them is a sense of presence, which is really, really fascinating to me, right? And so, 
what what I think that has to do with, with what is that loop. I'm, I'm going to put out a proposal. That loop is part of what we're trying to talk about in dialog in dialogos, and we can enhance that loop with language, but we can participate in that loop without language. And we can participate, and like I said, we can participate in that loop in a really interesting way. And this is where I have to pass from the scientist to the rover, uh, scientist back to Carter. But I want to say one thing about the scientist. The scientists say some, these are hard, literal rocket scientists, by the way, hard node scientists. And they'll do things like this. They'll say, I was working in the garden and my right wrist kept getting stuck. And I came to the lab and Spirit's right wheel was getting stuck. And then they sort of laugh nervously. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, but, you know, there's no magic, but there's some kind of sympathetic connection, right? And that's, that's really germane. Now, Carter picks yeah. up that sympathetic connection and he does something very interesting with it, right? And you can see this in, 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 in Nishitani. And I think this is in the Neoplatonic tradition. When I'm yeah. doing this loop, it's a profound kind of deep co-identification and it's a transformative ongoing. I'm, I'm shaping myself. I'm making a space so that within me, so, to, so I'll be shaped to the thou, right? And I'm allowing myself to be shaped into the thou. And those are two different directions. But what can happen is you can come, sorry, the spatial language is, is misleading, but it's all I have. You, I'll, I'll try this. You can come to experience you and you and the thou, I and the thou, as two species of the same genus or something like that. It's like, right, what's in me and what's there. They're not the same, but they ultimately are the same in something higher. And you get yeah. lifted up. So, so the participation Bingo. is not just this yeah. way. The participation is also that way to pick up on Guy's point. Paul, stop. Guy wants yeah. to say something. I've just, I've just, I'm struck by, I just had this thought, like, it's almost like the thou, when you, when the realization of the thou, it's almost like the it that we take ourselves with is like the phantom limb. And this thing up here is the real limb, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and I, uh, so that I just love the way that, the way that you just said that was instructive to my mind if I'm a, my, my, myself kind of experiencing it a little bit. But this sense of, I've always wondered about this. And, and, I, and I think people instinctively just know what I'm talking about here is like phenomenologically, when you have that moment with somebody, that moment of intimacy, right? It may be the first time that you've ever met them, but there's that moment where there's a recognition and for me, it's always this experience of, oh, there you are. Like as if, as if we just forgot each other for a while, but like we meet again. It's like there's a there's a quality of remembrance about, about the experience, that encounter of intimacy when it's recognized. There's a feeling that's more like. Oh yeah, like it, like it was as if it was already there. It was just a little bit to the left and you just went and looked there ever, but it was just right there. There we are. That that sense of the genus, is that what you called it at the top? Yeah, I was trying to use a I was trying to get out of a spatial yeah. metaphor by using a taxonomic yeah. metaphor. So yeah. so that moment so uh, and I'll, I'll, again to try and, for me that moment of recognition like recognition yeah. recognizing is also a, a, a memorable moment. And I'm gonna try and push on memory and yeah. reminding and sati and mindfulness. Because when I have encountered somebody as a thou and I've recognized them, I catch their geist. I, I, sorry, what I mean is they, they, they start to live in me, right? They start to live in me in, in a way, like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to use her name because I don't want to uh, trust, but the person, my, my, my beloved partner, she's with me all day. Like uh, she's not in my head as an idea or a set of facts, like the set of facts mm -hmm. and ideas I have about Bolivia. Mm -hmm. She's in my head as a voice, a presence, 
I don't like either one of those, but beyond that's so in the German word Geist is really good for that because it it's nicely touches the sort of voice, presence, spirit, shaping intelligible form. When that and that's what I mean about I've internalized mm. her. I, I've not consumed her. See the difference? I think one of the fundamental confusions yeah. is to confuse I it consumption with I thou internalization. Precisely because she speaks to me all day, I have I've been I have a better sensitivity to hearing her when we actually come back together and, and letting myself yeah. be tailored to her in that situation. So for me, and, the, and Plato tried to get this, I think, with his notion of anamnesis. It's, sinus, it's simultaneously a recognition. There you are. I didn't know trees could be like that. Or there you are. But it's also like this deep, it's memorable. It goes, like it becomes, ah, mm. I'm struggling. But do you, do you, is this tracking or landing with, what? Yeah. Seven. Yeah, I think I, I think I think this is very interesting. I want to also to go back on what you what you started saying earlier, John, was that, and Buber I think makes this point quite nicely that the I it in the I it relationship and the I in the I that relationship aren't the same eyes. Yes. Yes. But the yeah. self is a different self when it's relating to the other as an yeah, it or yeah. as a thou. Yeah. Uh, that we that we are fundamentally changed, which is why he says that there are these complete word pairs. And Buber really says that we only really become a real I when we encounter a thou, and Buber writes that when he encounters this piece of Mike and has his first mystical experience, he writes to his friend, he says, he says, for the first time, I was I, for the first time, I, I, I knew who I was, yeah. in encounter the fullness yeah. of the other. And that's that sense of participation where we are drawn out into the encounter of the other. And I think, I think this point is really a real point. I think it's something phenomenological, as Guy was saying, that we can walk around in the world, we can get stuck in this sort of solipsism you know in this uh the zombie thought experiment that maybe it's all just my projections maybe there's no real other entities out there and Buber was Buber, i think Buber's lifelong philosophical mission was a tirade against that position to say that yeah. no you have to encounter the things outside of you as really real as really demanding your presence and attention as really outside of you part of Buber jung's debates about the existence of god was that Buber felt that that god was too much psychologized even he has this he has this Critique of the mystical experiences, the bliss in German, as too much within the individual that can negate the real particulars of the other. And Bruce says, I don't want to, I cannot negate any particular of existence. I need the real thou outside of me. I yeah. want a real God outside of me, the relationship. And we can we can also get some why that's so important to him. But this sense that in that relationship is where we do become the self in that participation. And it's 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 particularly that move, not allowing us to collapse just into ourselves, as beautiful yeah. as that may be, is what he demands. And that I think that's also what, what Guy's talking about here is the, the remembering of the existence of the intelligibility of the world out there as something which we can interact with. And, and even if that somehow is connected back at top, even if it somehow becomes sort of the one true above in, some, in, in, a, in a platonic sense, maybe, it's a very real sense that there yeah. really is something out there. That, and, and only when I'm open to that can I, can I actually encounter you. Because if I just believe that you're just a projection of my own imagination, then I, I'm, I'm never thinking for myself because I'm never thinking, I'm never encountering your thought. I can never be challenged or made to think or made to or move yeah. by something else. It's only when I do it for myself to have my, my perception altered or changed or challenged, do I even be able, to, am I even able to begin to discover myself? And I think, I think this is a very strong Neoplatonic point, which is that when we can begin to discover that which is intelligible in the out there, in the real out there, we begin yeah. to discover the real within. Yeah. That's the that's the main move of Anagage. Uh, so I, this connects back beautifully again for me to write in Iris Murdoch, because Murdoch said, uh, "Love is when you genuinely recognize the realness of something other than yourself." Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. And so, and and, and, the, and that's the Platonic idea too that there is the 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 the, the loving that takes us outside of the solipsistic attractor. Right, and thereby allows us to come back and know ourselves more deeply. That love, yeah. right? It it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's the deepest kind of knowing, and, and that sounds like a hallmark card. But we're trying to get at something here that's beyond the hallmark card. In fact, the hallmark card tends to turn love into an it, mm. and we're trying to get Hell outside yeah. of the cliches. We're trying to get mm -hmm. back to, I think, when you really. I mean, this is a point that, you know, uh, a guy and I are reading this book right now uh, by Schindler on Plato, uh, uh, Plato's Critique of Impure Reason. And he actually at one point cites the, the, the Murdoch. Uh, but the idea that 
<laughs> this is like, brilliant when book, really, man. When you really realize that the the, the non me reality <laughs> of, of of something, right? It, 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 that you love it. Uh, there, there's the right the like like, like you were saying, baby. The, like when, when like when you're saying about the environment, uh, like understanding how everything that there's a real there the, that everything has a for itselfness, um, right? That's like Spinoza's Canadas, right? That does, is that allows for intimate relation because I can only relate to its for itselfness from my for itselfness, and then realize their inherent affinity. But but I can only do that with that what you and I like the way you put those two together, an, a, a, an intimate reverence, right? Yeah. Like I can only. But when I do that, it, uh, see, this is what I like, the, the, the platonic claim, and this is the response to nihilism and solipsism and all that is, that, 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 strikes, I, I, that strikes me as just inherently good, which is not a moral goodness or an aesthetic goodness. Or it's just, there's something about, it, like the degree to which I can reflect b back and my own for myselfness, which just, it just you know, intrinsically seems good to me, Right when I do this, I realize, but 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 that's the case for everything, right? And so any, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you know, you know, you loving your neighbor as yourself, a deep version of that. Like if if that's value, if that's in, inherently invaluable in me, it's inherently valuable in the vow of everything. Um, so I like I really like this idea of. Yeah, and I didn't want. I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to. I didn't, didn't want to do Hegelian thing of gather up the two poles into the one above. I was not trying to do that. I was. I was trying to get. Um, I was. I was trying to get a sense of. Let, let me put it this way. Let me try it this way. So we're doing the intimate reverence. We're getting the reciprocal opening. We get the know. We're getting the knowing that's a loving, right? We're getting. We're getting I to thou and and. and, and I, as Zevi said, I, I'm only truly starting to realize myself as I, I give myself over to the Tao. And so what's happening is my suchness, the suchness of the Tao are in resonance. But I also feel another dimension to it. There's also the moreness, right? So, and, and here's where I'm thinking of Blake, right? To see the world in a grain of sand. Yes, I, so at first I, I, I have to do that. I have to enter into that with the sand. Right, and it's it's absolutely unique. It's the grain of sand, but I also see the world in it, mm -hmm. all how all of it is present in it. And so, for me, that's what I'm trying to get with the vertical dimension. I'm trying to get when I'm in the I thou. And I, I, I this is what I'm trying to get with also with Buber's metaphor of the penetration, which right. Not only am I getting the suchness, suchness to suchness, there's also like, and, and this is part of beauty. There's more. There, like, there's an There's a way in which the inexhaustibility of all of reality is present. Yep. That's what I was trying to put my finger on. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't trying. I, 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 I don't want to set these off against these. I don't like I, I, off against each other. Um, so, yeah. Zevi, if I can just ask you, just like, do you think? Like, so Buber's concern is just like we can. I said, you know, we can we can confuse internalization with consumption, right? Is the, is the worry about mysticism perhaps that that self knowing of our own suchness can be confused with egocentrism or or a kind of self centeredness? Like I'm trying to get at the nature because I see like I'll shut up. What what, what do you think? Yeah, no, it's a it's it's a very it's a very interesting question. Um, I just want to, I don't know if this is a good habit or a bad habit, but I want to, I want to respond to two things that came up while he was speaking and then, and then yeah. move on to. Yeah, please. That's a good habit. It's a very good habit. Yeah. You're, so, you're so tending to the logos, which is good. So Buber, besides for being this, um, existentialist philosopher labels that he rejected categorically as, in, as the most philosophers reject their own labels that are put on them, yeah. but besides for being the existentialist philosopher that we know him to be. He's also, he, has, he also has like these two other full identities, intellectual identities. One is that he's a interpreter, translator, and popularizer of Hasidic mysticism. 
uh, the tradition that I was born into and grew up in. And he's also a Bible translator that he does yeah. along with Rasmus by translating the Bible in a very bizarre way into German, in a way that the that the the shockingness of the Hebrew would somehow be still in the German. He creates all these um, all these neologisms in German that that shock the reader to to contain something of the original shock in the verse. Um, and and there's two there's two points that, that that come from 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 those two sides of him, which which I think impinge upon this because obviously he's a complete person and these are all happening yeah. simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. One is yeah. one is a very beautiful line. Um, from Menachem Mendel of Kotsk, who was a Hasidic Rebbe, who Bubu was very infatuated by, among many others. The, the Kotsker was known for having this uh, absolute, unwavering pursuit of truth. Um, the stories told that that he he was so he was so allergic to to, to falsehood and all, all all kinds of so both in terms of personal falsehood, people that would come and pretend or effectuate, they were thrown out right away. But yeah. even in his writing, he only ended up ever writing in his lifetime. I mean, Hasidic Rebbe's wrote some of them wrote volumes and volumes and volumes he only wrote one piece of paper that was the only truth he could that was like what he was able to boil down and even that truth he was buried with because it was it was like he, he still felt unsure about it that it was maybe not and he, he took it with him to the grave literally the one the one piece of paper that he wrote so the, the Kotsker has this great line I'm going to say it in, in Yiddish because it's like really great in Yiddish and then I'll translate it into English he says and, and you'll hear a lot of the German Yiddish and a lot of the phrases that Bruber uses as well maybe he's borrowing them from from the Kotsker from this he says which means that if I am I because you are you and you are you because I am I then I'm not really I and you're not really you but if I am I because I am I and you are you because you are you then I am I and you are you and then this is how the, this is how the, this is how it ends and yet, Cameron, and then we can talk. Then we can enter into dialogue. But right. if my existence is simply predicated on an on not being you, it's simply a negation wow. of you. That I, I, my category, I'm, I'm this because you're not that. I, but, right. but if my, then, then I'm not really me, and you're not really you. There's no, there's no real meeting. That we're all just each other's projections. We're not. We don't have the existence that full totality. But if I'm really me in my own full existence, and you're really you in your full existence, and we're able to recognize that of each other, then we can come and we can be in real dialogue. And we can really talk, yeah. um, which is which which is part of you mentioned this thing of that to, to love your neighbors yourself. When Buba translates the biblical um, commandment, hafta lirecha kamecha, you should love your neighbor as yourself, as it's usually translated, he doesn't translate it as yourself. He says you should love your neighbor kamecha because he is a self, like you are a self. No, Not that he's better. like yourself, he yeah. is his own, he or she is their own self. Good, like good. Yourself, like, like you are yeah. your own self. Um, and that's that's a very beautiful thing that he does in the German. So a bit of a bit of his Hasidic side and a bit of his Bible translator side coming here into this into this this need to recognize the other as really other, so that dialogue can happen, so that love can happen, right? Both yeah. dialogue and love. In in terms of in terms of the question of, of mysticism, um, it's it's a very interesting because because he 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 finds I mean his early works he he writes uh, a work called Ecstatic Confessions um, with a tremendous uh, which is a tremendous compilation of mystical uh, testimonies from from mainly Christian mystics, but it becomes a, a real staple in German literature. Um, he writes Daniel, which is a work of tremendous mystical poetry. He does his PhD dissertation on Nicholas of Cusa and Jacob Burma, yeah. two yeah. fantastic, um, you know, middle age Christ, uh, Christian German mystics. So he's 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 fully fully. I mean, he's fully in that. But I think what you see in his mystical writings, and I'm 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 but being a student of mysticism and a student of Buber, I've taken an interest in them, uh, and and his 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 poetry inspired sort of by this aphoristic, prophetic version of 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 Nietzsche's is really something to knock one off one's feet. You see you see that there's constantly one thing which nags him about about the mystic, which is that the mystic, and and he's writing about himself, right? Because he is the mystic in that phase. He, he never knows whether this is really, really real or it's really just outside him. He never knows if the sound of, he writes this, if the sound of the ocean is just the internal waters that are, that are bouncing around inside and not really something outside. And he, he really wants that real thing, which is beyond him, which is outside him. He wants, he wants a God, which is not just a product of our psychology. He wants an experience, which is not just internal and narcissistic. So I think, I think there's two, there's one worry, which is a simple worry, which is that mysticism can lead to narcissism. It can lead to megalomania. It can lead, it can lead to, to solipsism, it can, it can lead to sort of me just being on my own ego trip. It becomes this hedonistic, yeah. um, like spiritual spirituality as its own pleasure trip, which which is a real concern. Yeah. But, but I think I think 
I think I think that the, the philosophical concern, which for him is also, is, is also a real concern, is that there needs to be something real outside which grounds his own relationality and his own love and his own experience of that real as not simply him just being alone with himself in the universe, however beautiful that is. He really wants something outside of him. Um, and not to not to psychologize Buber because I don't I don't think that's fair to do, but but um, Paul Mendes Flohr, who's who's a very famous um, intellectual biographer who who wrote who writes the intellectual biography of Buber, he writes about uh, a very very tragic moment when Buber's three years old, where his mother uh, leaves the family to yeah, invoke yeah. the Russian soldier, and 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 Mendes Flohr makes the case throughout the book that that it's Buber's real desire for the for 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 his mother for that real thing which is outside of him to turn back to love him and he and he writes that that as Buber standing by these big French windows he, he grew up quite wealthily he's calling out to his mother he's saying mama mama and she doesn't turn around she doesn't never only once later in his life when he's when he's, when he's already um, a grandfather brings his brings his children to to, to meet his mother they, he can't make eye contact with her there's like there's like this this rupture of relation and 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 for for Mendes Flor, it's this desire to to really relate to the mother, to relate to the other. He writes a love letter to his wife when he when he ends up, you know, in, in, when they finally come into that relationship. And he says, "I've now found I've now found my mother." It's like a very it's a very weird ring. To, yeah, wow. He's, yeah. he's looking for and, and he's, all of his the, so many of his theological metaphors is the is the child in the womb returning to the womb, returning to the maternal, returning to the mother. And, and, and the mother in Jewish mysticism is, is the material, is the earthly, is the real. So I, I get the sense that, that Buber, he, I mean, he's a very young intellectual at the age of 14 and 16, he's already reading Nietzsche and Kant, and he's being lost in these abstractions. He wants the real, and he feels like the mystic is too quick to dismiss the real or, or, to, or to fall into just themselves, and that's all that exists. And Buber needs it to be done with other, with the real other, with that which is really outside them, and to come into that space of, of love and, and knowledge of the other, and 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 that's, I mean, I I, I don't I don't want to play up the the psychologization to reduce it to that, um, because I, because I think that the point stands even without that experience, but I, but I think this is real driving force through his thought. Mm -hmm. So this would also explain the you know the antipathy and critique he has of Jung. Then. So he he's worried about because Jung is so deeply Kantian, and Jung often. Yeah. In fact, explicitly refuses to make any metaphysical or ontological claims, um, and, and so Buber is going to be very, very um, antagonistic towards that. So, to, to what degree then? And I'm asking both of you this: mm -hmm. what degree then is? I mean, so I, I, I have sort of a, a, an argument I'll make elsewhere, but I'll just allude to it here. I, I think people become great if they not only speak of things, but they exemplify things uh, in, the, in their own lives that are, have, have general relevance um, in an important way. Um, so Buber's hunger for, and I'm, I want to use this word because I've, I've done a lot of work on it. Buber's hunger for religio, the hunger for connection to what is real, um, yeah. as, as real, yeah. which, you know, is, um, Plato argues that's one of our greatest meta drives. In addition to whatever we want, we want it we want which satisfies our want to be real, uh, and that tr that trumps everything else. Um, to what degree is that hunger for the uh, an intimate relevance and reverence of reality? Is that like I'm seeing that as symptomatic, pervasive for modernity in an important way? That his big time. Attempt big time. But you see, but but the, the but the, see, as soon as we say that again, the, the horizontal and the vertical dimensions come in, because part of what I mean yep. when something's real is not only that it's outside of me, it's also deeper than me. It's it, so people don't yeah. just want connection; they want connection to what's deep, right? Which is significant, right? Um, and so here, here, let's let's now that we're we'll step out of the, the psychologizing for a second. You weren't, but you were worried about it, I'm sorry. Um, to the postmodern critique, because the postmodern critique is basically, sorry, <laughs> that was going to be way too hubristic. One important dimension of the postmodern critique is you can't actually get presence. And the longing for presence is a fundamental mistake. And insofar as you're trying to do that, your, your quest for the real 
is ultimately, you know, hegemonic and logocentric and all the insult words. But the idea is no, no, no. And you can see like, and this is the direct heritage from, you know, Kant and back, back through Kant to nominalism. No, 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 right? All there is are, is the play of signs. And your attempt to get out of this is actually what's causing your suffering and causing you to oppress and to hurt other people. And then notice the little sneak, sneaking thing that just happened at the end there, which is I sneak in the presence of the other that I have some sort of direct moral access to. And you, see, you can see yeah. how Levinas has a huge impact on Derrida around that. So, so I'm trying now to, let's, let, let, so I, you know, we've done some good exegesis. I'm not trying to, let's zoom out a bit. We can zoom back into Buber when we yeah. need to, but yeah. like, what is this telling us? And what is this telling us again about two things? The relationship between dialogus and mysticism, and then the, the relationship between that relationship and our hunger and love because Plato says they're always mixed together, right? Uh, for the real. Yeah. So that's that. Yeah. Does that, yeah. does that the, question feels like it lands now? Yeah, yeah. And I just I want I want to say, and I have no idea if this if this fits or not, but it's been coming up a bunch, and and what everybody's been been saying. Um, I just want to presence too. So the aliveness of this conversation is just intense, right? It's really great. Yeah. I'm having a great time with you guys. So thank you, thank you for vowing with me. Um, very much so yeah yeah my my eye is given by you thank you um <laughs> the uh i've been thinking about this sense of this is what i was encountering too with boober like there, there is this sense of like this deep deep hunger for the real right and what does he really mean by that right what does he really mean by that um, and I, and it, and it is why I'm glad that you're bringing up this sense of the way that postmodernity kind of unhooks presence, right? That you can't get presence anywhere, right? It's, it becomes deeply, it becomes deeply suspicious of the, of presence. And it, right. it, so yeah. one sloganistic, and please remember that adjective way of understanding yeah. postmodernism is to challenge the equation of realness with presence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is this is also where I think Nishitani's critique, right, about, about Nietzsche, right, is that he didn't take he he didn't take he didn't take nihilism deep enough, right? He didn't take the nothing deep enough because he didn't negate the negation. And I keep hearing this, right, of this this sense of of the way that Nishitani talks about this, and you can almost hear it in the I thou. It's like where there's we negate, there's the, the, the two it's, myself as an it, you as an it, right? You negate that, right? That's the first negation in coming together, right? And then, and then when you go to somehow, you go to I, thou, it's almost like um, you negate, <laughs> you negate the I, it, and then return back into some kind, there's a, there's a, there's a different kind of realness that goes on, right? Mm -hmm. There but it is something about this negating the negation of this full loop where you're kind of somehow on the field of sunyata. And it is very much like this sense where, where yeah. you know, you have conversations in this space and it's like people turn into almost like talking phantoms, right? They're like space themselves, like kind of open up and they speak things that are, they don't even, they don't even know. <laughs> they have no, not qualified to say, right? This is... This is a lot of, uh, about this thing with dialogos. Mm -hmm. And I have this sense that there's, it's, there's this dichotomy that, that somehow is being pulled on here about this, this sense of presence that I, un what I understand that to mean is that like, if we say presence has this constant thingness, right? Right, like this, um, this constant identity right? That it, as if it's completely solid as a ground. But I would have to say that like, I would have to say these experiences are, are like precisely um, release you from that, from the grip of that, of the I it, right? Like I would say that that kind of presence that they're talking about is probably like more of the I it. The I thou is something like 
the negating the like the negating of that negating the negation so you come back and you the the, the reification you can you can you can work in domains that are more real but you're less reified right and you return in some sense walk away with that sense of things glowing right in that way and this may be the link back into like the mystical yeah can i jump in on that guy yeah I, I think I think I think that really um, like is, is really getting at something really rich here, which is which is some sort of rapprochement between these two sides, between this negation and the real, where where they yeah. where, where this negation and the negation. And maybe maybe to, to flesh that out a little, because a lot of this work is done in, in mystical thought. A lot of us um, know about sort of the apophatic theology of the West, this mm. this this way of yeah. unsaying this 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 via negativa, and, and and I think there's actually a place here where postmodernism. Uh, it doesn't have to be the boogie monster that it is, but there's actually a deep mystical side to it. And I think you see that a lot yep. through Derrida. I think, I think particularly yeah, when we talk yeah, about big time, specifically yeah. in, a Buddhist, in a Buddhist mystical mindset, which John is, is you know, his teachers, that there's a lot of that. And But even in the West, and sort of to, to maybe sort of begin from here, there's this notion of, of this hunger for the real, as, as we've been saying, which I think is a good phrase for this part of the conversation, which John calls the ontonormativity, the sense that they're yep. really real yep. out there, in which commands our presence yes. and, that, and that the sense that, that when returning to ordinary life to ordinary states of consciousness it feels like an illusion in comparison to what we experience in in the mystical state yeah. Um, yeah. and and I, and I think and i think this is a really powerful point here this this sense that in in in, in kabbalistic jargon for example we speak about well, there's many names for god um one of them is is ayin god as nothingness of the capital n and the point here specifically is what john was what guy was saying that it's nothing in that it's no thing. It's yeah. not an object. It's that yeah. cannot be made an object. It is that which is the eternal thou is the nothing. It's the no thing. It's the non-object. And I think that a lot of the scholarship around mysticism assumes that the mystics are talking about God theistically and therefore are trying to get to this object yeah. called God, this transcendental yeah. yeah. object. And reading them, it's so it's so absurd. It's like, no, they're not trying to get to some sort of transcendental Russell's teapot alien with yeah. a beard out there. Uh, and, and I think a lot of a lot of the very good critiques of that way of thinking about mysticism point out that, that the mystic is precisely getting to that, which is which is not a thing. It's not an object. It's not yeah. something which can be languaged. It's it's precisely that which is the negation. But but simultaneously, and this is a, th a thought which is paradoxical, but maybe we can try to bring it into the human relationship to make sense of it. It's 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 precisely in that full negation of any categorization where we encounter the realist real in behind the no thingness behind and even in the postmodern critique i think in or, or a element of the postmodern critique as you said when when we when we get rid of the the sense that there is some sort of uh presence or some sort of substance or some sort of essence of this thing we get to the full base of reality whether there's there's a full destruction of any essentialism it's the full sunyata of the buddhist there's in that no thingness is the full realness and i think i think you see this very clearly when 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 lacan and derrida and foucault talk about the 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 immanentism i mean they they, they latch onto boob sorry they latch onto onto spinoza for this reason they seem as the philosopher of, of immanentism that this full imminence once we've deconstructed the sort of the, this middle ground of, of is this yeah. thing real how real is it how does it fit into our axiology of realness it's like no there's an obliteration of any of this hierarchy where, where everything is is absolutely the eternal thou and i think that when traditional ways of thinking about religion or mysticism or politics or theology or anything tries to hang on to a hierarchical structure of reality, that's where the critique comes in because we because we think that oh, on that level of reality, like for the Neoplatonic, it might, it might be announced for the for the Kabbalist, yeah. for for the, for what it's like at some point, it's like oh, that's more real and. It's like, no, no, the, the, the end game is that that's all, no, it's all nothing. It's all, to use the language of the Kabbalists, it's all kulei kamei kalach hashik. It's all zero. And when we when we find the full zero, um, that's when we, fi we find the full real. Maybe just to make a bit of sense of this in, in the relational, to take it away from the metaph metaphysical, when, when you encounter the other, right? A lover, a spouse, a partner, a student, uh, a parent, uh, a stranger in their full presence, and you, you have that I, thou, what was it that was communicated? What, what was it that was experienced? What was it that was present? And Buber says, there's nothing. There's no proposition. There's no content. There's, no, there's, nothing which, there's nothing which you can even use to describe what that person is in their essence for you. There's, mm. it's, 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 it's nothing with a capital N, which is so real. And, and I think we think about these terms oppositionally. We think about realness and nothingness as, as oppositions. And I think the point which, which Buber, the mystics perhaps, and, and, and postmodern thought, um, are saying is that is that that the full no, no thingness is the real, and it's that which cannot be made into a thing, um, and and I, th I think that's a 
it's it's very it's very apparent that that's what Uber is getting at to 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 come back to that figure. Yeah. So, so that that's interesting then because there's a sense in well one thing that I'm hearing you and I, I agree with everything you said I think that was beautiful. Um, yeah. But it, it strikes me then that there's sorry I'm going to be sort of more of an analytic philosopher here for a second. There's two me I think there's two meanings to this word presence. And I think they ha there, there's equivocation and conflation going on and we haven't properly pulled them apart because the kind of presence you're talking about, uh, uh, right, is, is not the presentation, if I'll, I'll use a slightly different word, it's not the presentation of a thing, right? Yeah. right? So we, and, and think about how the word exist means to stand out. And so standing out, I present the thing to you, here, I present the thing to you, right? And is and so we can think of presence as presentation of you all that. And then we can think of existence as when something has been fully presented to us. And I think that sense of presence is subject to the postmodern critique because this is an act of signification and it only works by contrasting this foreground with the background. And then what the, but the background isn't inherently the background and blah, 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 blah. And all that, and then all of that just unfolds. And I've got, you know, re there's relevance realization running around in it. But I'm hearing, and, and Seven, you and I talked about this, and you and I talked about this too, guys. I'm hearing another, and this is where it's going to be really tricky. Something else, yeah. Right? Right? So we're in new right? territory now. Yeah, it's going to be tricky because I, I'm, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to exemplify what we're talking about. But there's a sense of presence that is not, if you'll allow me, not presentation. Yeah. Right? And, 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 and so it, it have, First of all, Zevi, you said yeah, so that that's tracking with what you said. Yeah, in, in the sense that I think presentation also has the connotation that it's it's mm. uh, it's a, it's appearance of some sorts. It's uh, what how am I trying to um, present myself? What what am I what am I choosing to put forward of myself? Right? Who who am I for this conversation? As soon as you're doing that, you're 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 eating yourself. You're no longer making room for thou, right? Once yeah. Is that yeah. what you're getting at, John? Reification uh, well, uh, is the key. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. I'm getting at the idea of presentation uh, 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 as, you know, and I, I'm, I'm presenting it, which means, um, right, I, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing a bunch of things. I'm, I'm presenting it so it's now ready for reason. It can be categorized. It can be used. And I'm also, um, I'm centering your attention on it in a way that diminishes it, its relationship with other things. And I'm trying to get I, I almost like, before we even get to a conceptual abstraction, there's a phenomenological abstraction yeah. up there. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get at, that we're, we're, we're like this, the, right? That we're we're doing this, we're doing we're thingifying it as we present it, and and we're, and, and we're and, and and I think you're right. We're 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 always presenting it to someone, even if it's to myself. Uh, yes. And so I'm yeah. trying to get. At, so, I'm so, trying to get. At, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get. One more one more sentence, guy, and then I'll shut up. Yeah. I'm trying to get at what, what I'm trying to get at with presentation in contrast to presence is I'm trying to get at a phenomenological abstraction that precedes and can. Uh, and, and can also uh, afford conceptual abstraction. Yeah. Yeah. Guy? The, well, I, I'm just wondering about, I keep thinking about one of the things that we do in, in um, I've done this in my advanced courses, right? Well, even, even for beginners, we're trying to get at something like this experientially, which is to get at what are you actually seeing when you see another? Right. What is that perception? Right. And, and so what, what I'll do is I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, um, you know, you'll go face to face with somebody and I'll, I'll, I'll have you look right at the person's eyeball. Right. Um, and I'll say, okay, now go ahead and just zero in on their eyeball and describe it in detail. Right. And really get the sense of the physicality of the eyeball. Right. And then I'll be like, okay, now keep your eye right there. Now see Zev or see John. Move from seeing the eyeball to seeing John. And there's this, you can see people go, <laughs> there's this experience of like, 
And you really kind of get this sense that, and I, I, I think that there's something, there's a starting point there around this. I still, to, to this day, I still don't quite know exactly what the hell I'm seeing when I see you, right? It, but there's a, re, there's a perception, right? But it's not, it's not a thing in the, in, in the normal sense of the word. Yes. So I've been trying to get at this phenomenologically with the, what happens in that moment, unlike, unlike presentation, what happens is like, in, 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 right? Because one way, and, and I know this is not what's happening, one way of trivializing that is, oh, the person just went from a feature to the gestalt. So what? what, what mm -hmm. No, no. I think when it, when it impacts people, what happens is, right, it's it, like, I'm, I, instead of foreground background, I'm trying to say that their that presence is, I'm just going to use this language, it's, it's the moreness into the suchness and the suchness into the moreness. And that That's is it. different. That is different from this mm -hmm. act of presenting mm -hmm. something yeah. to you. Yeah. That, that's sorry. I'm 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 struggling here, but I'm yeah. trying to get at something. Can I? It's the hyphen. Yeah. Can I try? Can I try maybe add, add a bit of language here? Yep. Um. There's there's a biblical term which might be relevant to this, and if it is, this will help me understand what 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 you guys are getting at. There's that. So there there are people that are asked like, who are you in the Bible? Or and uh, yeah. and and they and there's responses. You know, I'm the slave of such and such. I'm the local from such and such. I'm and we do this in our daily life all the time, right? Whereas, so so who are you? Oh yeah, I'm a I'm a this. I'm a that. I'm a professor. I'm a student. I'm from here. Then there's another expression in the Bible where where we ask where we ask someone existentially, who are they? Uh, where are they? Sometimes ayeko is, is is the first time it's used in the Bible in Genesis. And there's a very beautiful word in Hebrew, which which is which is hineni. Which is which is made up of two Hebrew words. It's hine ani. It's here am I. Here I am. Hineni is the response when when you call out and say and say where are you or who are you. The response is, it is the I who is here. It is the I am who is here. Where where there's no categorization. I, I can't say I'm I'm a guy. I'm this years old. This is my nationality. This is my ideas. It's just. So, so presentation would be all of that, right? I'm, I'm presenting yeah, yeah. my, my CV, yeah, yeah. I'm presenting exactly. all the exactly. labels, yes. the but, but, but presence is, is simply to say, Hineni, Hine Ani, here is I, here I am, um, which, which, is, yeah. which is that immediacy, yeah. Which is also saying nothing, I'm saying nothing in that sentence, but I'm, but I'm saying everything. But, you, but you're calling to the person, right? To bring back the autonomativity, right? right. You, you're you're, yes. you're, you're yeah. calling to the person, you're trying to, you're trying to get them. Like there's a demand. Like yeah. it's not just the statement. There's a demand in there, right? It's mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's always in response to a call. So I think one of the famous cases where it's used is where where God calls Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, and he calls out um, Avram, Avram, Abraham, Abraham, and Abraham says, "Hineni, here I am." It's it's a sense of readiness. It's a yeah. uh, it's it's a, it's a response to a call to to initiate. It's. It's it's here I am. I'm here to receive. I'm here to hear. I'm here to participate in what it is that you need from me as as a me as an I. So it's an act of it's an act of commitment then too. Yes, yeah. It's 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 an act of it's an act of commitment. It's it's saying I'm I'm here and available and ready. I'm 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 present for what it is that you've called my name for. Mm, yeah. So there's something yes. in the person that's also responding to the call. In order to and and that's yeah. right and, and and so above all the ways this. I can present myself, there's a call that reaches deeper, and from yeah. that I respond. Am I understanding yes. correctly? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's a perfect description of, of what's of what that, that's what, what that's what I was trying to get at. Because so let me use a linguistic analogy. Uh, so mm -hmm. you know, before I can categorize these are both books, right? This is this right. I, I have to do demonstrative reference this this and that pre that makes possible any conceptualization because if i can't yeah. i'm going to turn it into verb if i can't thisness if i can't this 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 and if i can't this this then i can't this to them together and then get them together so i can start to do a concept and that's what i'm trying to get out with the suchness i'm trying to get out the the demonstrative yeah reference right the, the, the demonstrative yeah. indexicality of us yeah like we're, so yeah. like the way the way yeah. i is it, like the way i points in that purely manner and that's what i was trying to get at the suchness but yeah. what i want to try and get with the suchness into the moreness is 
what am I looking for? I want to, I, the iconic, and I'm, I'm using it very careful in contrast to the idol, that even when I come into the sort of the face, the front edge of your presence and your suchness, there's a, there's a depth behind it and beyond it and above it and through it that, right, that permeates it. That's what I'm trying to get at. That, so that the, yeah. I, I was also trying to challenge something you said earlier, not challenge what you said, but challenge a, a way, uh, 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 right? Something you pointed to is I don't want to, I don't want suchness to be understood as the appearance of the thing. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. Because it's, yes, yes. Yeah. Because I hear what you're saying. It, 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 it almost, in some sense, it, for it to be suchness, to, let's just say goes from appearance to suchness, if we look at it like that, yeah. I would say is precisely when the moreness comes, somehow yeah. comes in involvement, yes. right? Yeah. It's this, do, it's this, it's this double fr, uh, presencing, right? Yes. Of, I, want, yeah. I, want, I want to get at, it's not only the non-categorical nature of the suchness, right? Yeah. It, but but, it, but it, that's a negative way of putting it. But there's a moreness in yeah. that there's it's more than anything I could think about it. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm trying to get yeah. at. I'm trying to get it, and I'm trying to get that there's a dynamic in there yeah. that's presencing that is yeah. different than presentation. That's what I'm trying to yeah. get at. Yeah, totally. It's kind of like it's the thing that, you know, this is where I think that this is and what I what I'm I'm probably gonna do in my my thing next time is gonna talk about this about idle talk. The difference yeah, between idle yeah. talk and authenticity and discourse, which is vague and is not totally worked out in Heidegger, that I think Buber is in some sense addressing this, right? But um, what was I going to say? That that there's there's it, it's it's got this element of um, the way that Heidegger talks about death, right? And I wanted I'm also wondering about the way the way death. What, what is the death's, what, in, in what way is death present in the I thou, right? Mm -hmm. um, in what way is death involved in that, in that perception? Not my, our demise necessarily, but the, 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 the ontological our, sense our of death that yeah. being, being in time is essentially about, right? Our mortality. There seems like that's got to be central in there some way. And I don't know exactly how, but I have a feeling that you're starting to get at that with this, of this, um, this way that in a, in a later, like Heidegger talked about this in terms of Gestell, or not Gestell, uh, that's the, the opposite of Gestell is, um, oh, what is it, uh, Arignus, mm -hmm. right? Which is this quality, uh, it is not a being. This is, the, this is the important part, right? Like it's not a being, right? It's, a, it's something other than being, but it's this quality of where, where the, se the, um, the self-concealing with like, com um, in some sense, unconceals in its withdrawal, yes, right? Yes, that's that's yeah, yeah, Gestell, yeah. something like that, yeah, right? You, you the, the event shining, of, yeah. The, the shining into the suchness as it withdraws into the morning right. kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's this kind of kind of way where, and there's, a, there's also this quality of, of, of with, with that, where, where, where is, there is that sense of remembrance yeah. and, it, and it's, it, it's interesting because it's um yeah this is we're right at the edge of like the, we're right on something that doesn't quite have a word right for it but i think Burba, boober would be proud of us i'll just say one more thing and i'll let Zevi talk I, I i that's what i think that i think we're we're resonating because the, 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 the problem with sort of the the, the demonstrative indexicality is it can feel like you can you, you can get a metaphor of just touching something right yeah. Th this yeah. right or just pointing yeah. at it. but i don't I, that's insufficient that's what i'm trying to get beyond the suchness it's good i don't touch it i, I like yeah. i like i i i move i i move I, I deeply indwell it as i deeply internalize it to go back to something i said earlier. Yeah. that's what i'm trying to get with yeah. that, that 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 space of that movement is part of what i'm trying to point to with the so I, I agree with the, the the no thingness of the suchness, but I also want to I also want to get the depth, right? The depth yeah. that I'm trying to convey with yeah. the nearness. Yeah, so what I'm thinking about the death, the, the sense of that 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 sense of right, the possibility of impo the, like the horizon that you can't ever reach, but it's a exactly it both pushes you back, 
right? So what I was trying to pick up on Heidegger's idea about the, with the moreness is, is like being immortal is not knowing you're going to die. Being immortal is knowing that yeah. there are things you can never capture, no matter how many thoughts you have about that thing, right? That, that, that's part of the idea of, uh, 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 yeah. uh, because that, well, I'll stop. Good. Can I, can I complicate this a little? Please. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make this rapprochement between the mystical and the dialogical. Um, yeah. So th there's definitely, I, th I think both phenomenologically in like contemporary culture and in philosophy, there's this aversion and this disdain for the fakeness, right? It's, it's the same thing, which, which cuts hated, he hated the fake. And we hate that. We hate people that are fake. We hate people that aren't, that are ingenuine, people that put on fake faces. We hate, uh, we hate small talk because it's fake talk. These are all the things that we disdain. And metaphysically, we, we hate the fake, we want the real, right? This is part of it as well. And, and therefore there's this desire to go beyond the surface because the face is seen as, as the yeah. place of, of fakeness. And, and I think there is that sense of depth, which you're pointing out in Buber, when he speaks about the eternal thou that yeah. permeates all thou, all yeah. I thou in consciousness. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, a vertical, that's a vertical dimension, right? right? Yeah. So I want to, I want to, I want to grant that, but, but, but I, I think that's only one, I think that's only sort of one phase of, of thinking about reality. I think, I think that perhaps where the mystic meets the dialogical is to say that, and this, this is a point which, which harkens back to, to Buddhist flavored postmodern yeah, and, yeah. The, and so the elements of Jewish mysticism here, where, where there's this precise realization that that the things are as they are, and that the, that the depth is on the surface. That the 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 that the, the sense that that nirvana, that nirvana is realizing that samsara is no other than nirvana. That realizing that there is this collapse between depth and surface. It's a very interesting wordplay in Hebrew, which is that in Hebrew, uh, face is panim, and 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 the inside, the depth is pnim, which ah. the verb, they're, they're almost indistinguishable, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So there's this sense, there's a sense that. That th there is there is like this sort of ontology where we have a distinction between depth and and surface, and in that ontology there is place for fakeness, and in that ontology there is need to go beyond it and to encounter the thou, which then connects us vertically, mm -hmm. and and there there is that hierarchical model. But I think there's a second step, which it, which which can be made, and and it's it's a tension to hold both of these together. And this is we we in in Buddhism we speak of the um there's there's sort of this, this dual reality in, in in Kabbalistic metaphor we speak about the the two levels of unity there there is a lot of this dual metaphysic that I'm putting out is is a common amongst mystical traditions which is that there's, there's there's a second level of reality where where we no longer have that concern of getting beyond the fake to the real getting beyond the face to the inside because because it's in, in, everything is inherently ready thou it's it's a space where where nothing can be eyed and therefore there's no concern of of seeing someone's face and seeing the lie because everything is on the face, because everything is there already. And when you stare at someone's face, you see their entirety of being straight into and through them all on the face. And it's that it's that collapsing of, of, of depth and surface. It's it's that it's that it's that it's that depth. It's the it's the uh, to use the one of the first verses of Genesis. It's the it's the uh, the spirit of God which hovers upon the surface of the water. It's the thou which is there, which is which is which is on the surface. You don't need to dive into the ocean to to see the thou. It's 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 ever present yeah. because. It's, because all of reality is, is necessarily permeated by that ontological realness. Um, and, and I think, I think that, that, that kind of works for the postmodern thinker who, 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 who negates presence, but also who negates presentation, but also has the full presence. And somehow there is a place where, where, where presence must be uh, that which is presented and vice versa. So yeah, so a bit of a wrench maybe. That's good. That's good. I mean, uh, I, that's, I was trying. I, 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 I was trying to allow for the uh, yeah. the non logical identity between because that's why I tried to say the suchness into the moreness and the moreness into right. the suchness, right? But then you're also saying, yeah, that. So if you if, if you're allowing that, is you're saying, but there is the thing you said at the end. But there's a relationship also, a deep relationship. You you allow me to call that presence because you said there's a relationship between pre, something like between presence and presentation. So that yeah. right that mm -hmm. so you know uh when i started before i, I did did zen rivers were rivers and mountains were mountains right. while i was doing zen rivers weren't rivers and mountains were its mountains and then when i was done doing zen rivers are rivers and mountains are mountains and they usually put it in caps it's a negation and the negation well, yeah yeah but the, the point is it's a non-logical identity that, and, and that's yeah. that's what that's what's very very difficult 
because the temptation with non-logical identity is to use what is most familiar for us for non-logical identity, which is the narrative. And we're looking, so we're trying to come up with a narrative answer to this. And, 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 yeah. and for me, that, that is part of, that's, that's yeah. another a mistake that's that we issue. often engage in, right? So, mm -hmm. I, I, so I think that's exactly right what you just said, Zevi. And I'm, I'm trying to get at that, what i'm trying like what's the mapping so uh it is 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 dialogos is dialogos trying to like use speech to bridge between presence and presentation and then mystical realization is when that that non-logical identity occurs or I, that's i'm just asking that as a question as a provocative question what's the what's the mapping that you were implying there? I, I, that's what i i, I want to get clear on yeah, I, I think you're right in that in that this schema rejects the linearity that that we're used to thinking in, um, and it's it's not so much once you place these things hierarchically one above the other we've, we've destroyed what that that truth we're trying to do. There's there's a sense of simultaneity of it. I think I think maybe to use the language that we've been using up until now is that in truth in every act of uh, of presentation, there must also be presence, right? Because yeah. if all is all, if the suchness is in, the, if the if the moreness is in the suchness, then even if I do try to care, even if I do try to reduce myself to some sort of category, I say hi, I'm Australian. There's something in the way that I said I'm Australian, which I can only say that there's only the way that 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 my my iness can 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 present in that particular way, and 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 there is the sense of 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 the of sort of the 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 the, the all the cosmos in a grain of sand where, where even when we yeah. are trying to do and I, I think part of the work maybe is of the, the work of dialogue maybe to scoop into dialogue where there is presentation happening and to see how all of that presentation is really expression of presence there's there's a there's a Hasidic idea which Buber is a big fan of which is that even in uh, literal small talk um this is this is this is something which goes back to the first Hasidic master that Rebbe Sarabal Shem he says that that if one uh, is is present in small talk. They can see how everything that's being spoken is really manifestations of the eternal thou. Is really all presence in what seems to be us um, presentation. So maybe it's not so much of a linearity that there's sort of that there's that there's there's one phase of reality where the other things and there's not. But but there's a sense where they can they can intermingle. And the work of dialogue is to is to is to see the. The, the maximal presence uh, in in every in every iteration of being in every moment of 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 of, of the expression yeah. of being. Yeah. So you said the in every presentation there's presence. Is it also the other way? Like I. Uh, um. So uh, that's it's an interesting question because because we talk ever a lot in. Is there ever presence without presentation? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so from from the perspective of, of, of the metaphysics of Jewish mysticism, there there is uh, as as in as in there is presence which which is never presentable. There's there's what's called um, etzem bilti mescal, that is the essence which never which which by definition does not and cannot reveal itself. Right. Um, which I mean, to, to to sort of unpack the implications of that would would be interesting. There's, I mean, I mean, if we think about it on on the individual level. There's there's, there is, I'll put it, there is if you're yeah. dyslexic. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't been dyslexic. My dyslexia is having a great time with this conversation. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there's, it, it's, it's interesting because, because we, we, okay, so this, this is a real paradox. It's, it's funny you should ask I asked this because in, this is, this is like, again, this is a, where I can hear the postmodernists wanting to come in. And, and wanting to say, well, well, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, I get that you may be saying that there's always, there's never presentation without presence, but there's always never presence without presentation, right? Um, I'll tell you something interesting. So, in sort of within the within the um, like the habitat of, of of Jewish mysticism itself, and Adam Peck, and this may be an interesting exercise, which which I haven't done yet, but just to sort of bring the raw material to the table. Yeah. There's, there's there's a notion. In, in Jewish mysticism, which is, I mean, very Neoplatonic in this point and many other points, yeah. and, and this is therefore a point which is relevant to many traditions, and also, I think, phenomenologically and existentially relevant too, um, is that there's, there's a distinction between, between that which is 
revealed, that which is presented, the, the light is the word that's used in these traditions, yeah. and, and the source of the light, right? There is there's yeah. that which shines yeah. and there's that which, which shines, which that comes which from the light, the sun and the rays that emerge from the sun. Yeah. Then, and that's, that's sort of the, the, the paradigm of, of the, the emanator and the emanator. This is another yeah. way that's yeah. But then But then there is the one, or there's the insuff, whatever it is, which, which is not even, uh, which, which has no relationship and has no relevance to expression. It's, it's that which is f be, f like just beyond expression. Never, it never even gets involved in this process of overflowing or, or emanating, yeah, right? right. Um, the, 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 the full paradox here is, is that the messianic vision uh, for the Jewish mystic is precisely the revelation of that which uh, co constitutionally and, 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 and definitionally cannot be revealed. It's, right. it's, it's, it's right. the gilly, it's the, it's the revelation of the essence, which is unrevealable, <laughs> uh, which like, you know, postmodernism eat your heart out. Yeah, but, um, there it is. So, wow. That's yeah. Yeah. So I wonder, that, I wonder that, that's, I wonder, there's the self-concealing, right? Yes. I wonder what we make of that, like phenomenologically or, or in a, in sort of this interpersonal dialogical barbarian context. That, uh, yeah, I, I, that, that's really interesting. Uh, because I, which part? Well, well what what I'm getting, I, I, I mean, and this might have been for maybe the, one of the core um, things we're we're trying to get at here. Like there's this sense of being in in relationship to that which it, you can't be in relationship to. Um, but but not only is that is it sort of uh, uh, some mystical state to put a label on it because we got to talk about it. Right, but, yeah. but it's it, it strikes me that that's also what Uber's trying to put his finger on in the eye. That like ultimately, yeah. I'm trying to get into a relation when I'm relating to someone in love, the way we've been talking about it here. Right, I, I'm getting into this state where I'm trying to relate to that about them, which is ultimately not does not enter into relation. Right, they're they're for themselvesness. Yeah. They're right. There's suchness into moreness, and and yet somehow, if I understand you, what you what you what you're pointing to, and what boot, maybe I'm, I'm maybe is this is this what somehow that happens, and for me phenomenologically, I'm not trying to reduce it to the phenomenology. Okay, I understand the distinction between ontology and phenomenology. In fact, that's what Buber wants ultimately, right? But, so, but from phenomenologically, that strikes me as that we have these two different senses of realness. And we move between them fluently and we have a non-logical non identity. One is yeah. real is that which confirms. Notice what I'm doing with my hand. The, the graspable. The real is the rational. The quote Hegel. And then the, other, and then the other notion is, no, the real is that which shocks me and takes me completely by surprise because that reveals my projections and my presuppositions. And somehow these are one, but they're not logically identical. And, and it sounds to me like yeah. that's the, phenomenolo the, 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 the phenomenology of realness is being captured in depth by this relation to that which is ultimately unrelatable. Does that, does that land? Does that sing? Yeah. Yeah. And is it, is it, is it kind of what the question is, is something like what the question that you're asking, John, like, I guess that we're asking at this point or discovering that we're asking, which is interesting mm -hmm. in itself, right? Is it exemplifying of, it, of itself? Like, um, is basically like, okay, the, there's these two that just flow together and we do it all the time, right? On some level yep. that we go back and forth, right? And flow together all the time must mean that on some level I have some already understanding of it. Uh, uh, what, uh, are you uh, asking, uh, what do I uh, already sorry, understand? Yeah. What, mm -hmm. do, what do you mean by the, yeah, you mean, do you mean the flow? I have the, the flow, the, the flowing yeah. of the, of these two yeah. modes, right? Of these two, these two things that don't come together. I think that just exemplifies, oh, there's something that we actually, that we already just do it, right? Yeah. What well, do we already understand? Right about those things, such that allows us to to participate, have participatory knowing. Yeah, right? I think that's in relationship right. with that. That's deeply right. Like, 
There's yeah. an analogy with virtue. If, 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 if you're in no way honest, I can't teach you honesty because I can't get you, I can't get you to be interested, inter, inter essay to be within it. I can't get you interested in it ever. If you don't have some honesty, right? I have no yeah. purchase on you. I'm using that, I'm using yeah. virtue as an analogy here, right? It, 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 so yeah. if, if I don't have any, if I don't have any realization happening, not in yeah. me, but through me, uh, prepositions mm -hmm. are failing me here. But if I don't have that, then I, I I can't ever I can't ever as you said I can't ever participate yeah. that in, in in that in in reality. Uh, yeah. But that yeah. that's that, that that's a deep way again of saying that 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 deep that process of self realization and the process right. of reality realizing yeah. they're 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 like they they belong yeah, so, together. So, so yeah. They belong together and they belong together in our in the way that we respond to them. So that so in some level, like what is it that we already understand that we enact, that we can enact them so deeply? I think is another way, uh, another way of kind of getting at this, or maybe the way way we're getting it. What is that? What do we already understand, right? In some sense. Not even, you know, I don't mean that, I know, I know, know, I, I know right? I know, yeah. That's why you said participated. Sevi wants yeah. to. Yeah, a point which always resonates with me on this is sort of this this marriage of the Heraclitian and Parmenian idea of yeah. of that which is always changing, that which is never changing, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and I, think, I think we know these to be true, like that that sense that that we're always changing and like we're we're, we're there's no stability of self. We're, we're constantly being recreated. Um, yeah. Um, and 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 but, but that sense that there's always something central and continuous, which 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 always has been us. It's always been that I that's always been there, and it's it's that same sort of relationship between yep, yep, the yep. real within, which which is which is graspable, which the outside which is graspable, and that real which is beyond grasping in ourselves. I think I think there's that beautiful marriage that happens there. There's a beautiful coincidental oppositorum to use the the language yep. of Kuza. Yep. I, I think I think and I think what you're saying, guy, here is is, is so beautiful that it's that it's in it's in discovering that which is happening within ourselves and then to, and then to be in relation to that same thing, which is happening out there, the real, which, yeah. which can be grasped and can't be grasped, uh, the real, which is changing, which isn't changing as, as the self is, but uh, yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe just to add a third point here, because, because one of the things that we mentioned going into this is that Buber speaks primarily about dialogue that it's two ways, it's die, it's, it's, yeah. it's two. Um, and what we're exemplifying here is try love that this three does, there's, yeah, there's yeah. a three. And, and and one thing which Buber does allow for this is that he he says that the meat that the realness happens not in the locus of of each of the participants but in the space between them. Yeah. Yeah. There's the, what yeah. John refers to as the we space, and I think yeah. I think what we're seeing here is as we're as we're grappling with these ideas and coming to something, there's something in between the three of us which we are all tri triangulating around, which is kind of this this, real, this graspable ungraspable realness. Within this this space, I'm like looking at the little point between our three screens on the Zoom. It's like <laughs> the, the loci of the real that, that that shines out. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, uh, I mean that, and from to use some of Buber's language, that 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 we space isn't isn't a static system of relations. It's very much a spirit becoming form. It's very it's very geisty, if you'll allow me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to to right. do a, an English right. transformation of a of a of a German right. word, right? It's very geisty, right. yeah. But it, right, but 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 there is but the, but then what people do? Uh, so, right, we get like we get a sense of the uh, of the uh, of the geist between us. But then what typically happens is you know, also what we're doing here is we're trying we're, we're not using that's not the right word our, our intimacy with the geist between us. We're trying to, right? We're trying to, we're trying to. What am I? I'm, I'm going to use the word sense, but I don't just mean sensation. I mean sense, like when we're making sense. We're, we're trying to sense through that intimacy, like something about realness, if if I can put it out. We, we get the intimacy with the spirit affords a deeper intimacy. Sorry, with the deeper language, but you know what I'm trying to do here. Well, a, a deeper intimacy with realness, and yet that realness is not abstract, even though it's deeper. It's it was in the very intimacy of the intimacy we're having with ourselves and yeah. with each other. It, it, yeah. Ah, ah, yeah. But that right, because that's what happens when we do. 
<coughs> when we do circling into Dia Logos, people pick up on the guys. The first, they're just like, they're just, there's just interpersonal intimacy. <coughs> but then the I thouing moves into people can get a, an intimacy with the guys that you'll allow me that. And then mm -hmm. sometimes it moves into, it moves into and through the guys without not leaving the guys behind into an intimacy with realness in the way we're trying yeah. to talk about here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm really interested in, in, in what's, and it's funny, Zevi, when, when, when you do this, people from all kinds of background, they yeah. fall into religious, spiritual, even mystical language yeah. when they try to describe it. Yeah. Right. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and so, sorry, I, this is a long way of answering, drawing on what Zevi said, but answering Guy. That's the already present that I'm really interested in. Like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Sorry, I'm doing narrative, the very thing I said I wouldn't do. That movement. That movement is what, because what I also yeah. see, Debbie, to use language we've talked about, I see an increasing sense of ontonormativity coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, the normativity towards mm -hmm. the other, and then the normativity oh. towards the, the, the we, and the, right? So the normativity to the thou, the normativity to the we, and then there's the normativity to be in. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I have a challenge for yeah. Guy, actually, if I can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So guy, guy, guy's a master of dialogue, um, particularly in the form of circles, but in general, this, this idea of dialogue. And Buber has this interesting expression to, to, to build on what you're saying here, which is um, existence as dialogue or, 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 or yeah. dialogue yeah. as existence or existence as dialogical, yeah. where, where it's, yeah. it's, it yeah. is yeah. The, 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 the fabric of reality yeah. is dialogical itself. Yep. Yep. I, I wonder, yeah. I wonder, I, want, I mean, with a human, it's too easy, but I wonder, so we, John mentioned before that when we, when we, if you want to learn about the pine, go to the pine. Right, yeah. I, the, the sense that we can interrogate and be in dialogue with nature itself. I would love Guy to see, do, to do a circling session and put like a pot plant on the chair and be like, just- He does that. He does that. Right? He walks around with the camera and, yes. there's no, and he's not talking to people. Mm -hmm. He he enters mm -hmm. into dialogical relation with his with his surroundings. He does that. Yeah, awesome. that's really awesome. Yeah, that's really, so you fulfilled yeah. my challenge even before I put it out. I'm gonna have to. <laughs> I'm gonna have to well, there, there is there there is something. Per, so, so if we just look at it right now, so we are we're in. I have this experience. I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I have this experience of us encountering something, right? Something's being revealed. It's still hidden, right? Like. But there's there's a there's a there's a presence of like there's a um, I have like a lot of euphoria right there's a lot of ecstatic there's like a little bit of like watching I'm 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 noticing I'm tempering my like wanting to grasp I'm I'm being tutored not to grasp in some way <laughs> right there's this there's this thinking there's this the the, the thinking up that. And the affinity for both of you is just off through the roofs. I mean, you guys are the best people in the world that ever existed right now. <laughs> That's what's happening on a personal level. Yeah. But, but there is um but, do, do but there's the, that, the, the, ever get yeah. that with the non-personal? Do you, like where we're talking about two minutes? Yeah. Person. Do you ever get that this when is, you're in this, nature? Or? This is this is what I was, this is uh, I think I've talked about this before, but I actually remember a specific time, I think it was when I was around five or six, where I just started to get a sense of that, the, that I could start to see the way the adult saw, right? And the way the adult saw was like, everything was kind of dimensional, right? And subjects and objects and, or something like that, right? And I remember at first, it would just come over me and then I, I'd notice it, it'd go away. And I didn't know how to get it back, right? And so I would try to like figure, I remember I used to play this game between myself with myself where I was like, okay, can I get it back, right? I remember like trying to twist my body and like I, I would be able to like will it back and it'd go away. And there's this whole period of time, right? Around five or six, I think, when this was going on. And there was a sense of like, when I look back, well, what was the, what was the, what was the difference? Like my world and their world, the adult world and my world, the child's world. And it was really clear my world, right? At that time was, it, everything was a thou. Mm. Everything was a who. Everything spoke. It's like everything had a personality to it. Like it just instinctively was that way. 
And that there was this kind of difference I started to note when I was a kid that I would try to like hold on to because it was so distinct where it's like the, the hallway um, it, it didn't it would stop speaking as a character or something like it's the darkness of it and a certain character to it. Now all of a sudden I just, just see it like as a box or something like that, right? And I, and I, yeah, and I knew at some point, I kind of also just had this sense of like, at some point I would lose the ability to go back and forth. And I just knew it. And I, yeah, I, and I think I tried to describe this whole experience to my dad and my grandpa at the time. I don't think I did a very good job. I don't think if I even did a good job just now, <laughs> they're both like. I thought it was perfect. Yeah. I thought it was yes. beautiful. Yeah. 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 I'm interested to hear what John has to say on this from, from a Kogsai perspective, but this, this sense that we think about children as childish, where they everything is personified and, and we put faces and googly eyes and everything. It's like very yeah. childish, right? To, to put faces on everything or to, to think about things as personalities, to not understand that, oh no, there's no personality, there's no. But 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 the sense that the sense that there is a, a valueness to things if we can allow it to, yeah. to if we can allow them to arrest us in our I it being for them to call out to us. I have this experience. I live, I live near a forest. When, when you're walking through the forest, you can kind of I it the nature around you and you're just like, yeah, yeah tree, material, this, carbon. Yeah. But then something will, sh- either because it's, you know, tremendously beautiful or, or, yeah. or grotesque mm-hmm. or whatever it is, it, it, it's arresting. It, it calls out to you. There's dialogue there. And, and yeah. Yeah. There, is, there is a thoughtness to whether it's a flower or yeah. a carcass yeah. or a, yeah. a sunset. Is it down? I'm wondering. I'm wondering, John. What's what's the what's the scientific? What's going on here? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, I don't want to reduce it to that. But not what, to bucks, yeah, yeah, not to bucks into 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 that. As no, no, well. no. Just, I'm, ha- I'm ha- I did. I, I'm supposed to take that role to some degree. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so what it reminds me of uh, uh, is um, Jill Bolte Taylor's uh, book, My Stroke of Insight, uh, where she like she was a neuroscientist. So, <clears throat> but she basically had a hemorrhage in the left hemisphere. Now, luckily it didn't kill anything. It just sort of uh, silenced it. And uh, <clears throat> she talks about, and notice the language is narrative and spatial, but nothing narrative or spatial is happening. Because she has to tell, she felt herself move to the right hemisphere. So she was only experiencing herself in the world in the right hemisphere. And then what happens is <clears throat> the right hemisphere, right? It, it, like she couldn't, she couldn't pick up the phone to dial it. Because right, because everything is interpenetrating everything else, and everything is 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 alive, and every like everything is everything is resonating. Um, and what what now, now, and guy, you'll like this because she got mm-hmm. because of her trauma, and I wouldn't wish the trauma on anybody. Mm-hmm. Right. But she in her rehabilitation, she acquired the very thing you lost because she 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 rehabilitated and she now has full capacity with her left hemisphere, but the uniqueness of that, she can always step to the right. She can shift back into and taste what that's like, what, yes. right? Now, yes. now I, I wanna be really, I wanna be really, really careful here, right? Because, you know, and, I, you know, and I've talked with Ian Nogal, Chris, and, and, and so, you know, because, mm-hmm. because of Ian's amazing work, there's a little bit of uh, romanticism and glorification of the right hemisphere mm-hmm. going on right, right mm-hmm. now. And I want to, I, I, and just to get the cog side in here and then be provocative, because mm-hmm. we haven't really talked about this, but I, I think it's really appropriate. And I'll talk about it in a while. I think it's appropriate. Insight and metaphor do not occur in the right hemisphere. They do not occur in the left hemisphere. They occur in the dramatic there movement you go. between them. There it is. There it is. Okay. Now, why I bring up is. insight is because insight is really, really interesting because insight is non-propositional in nature. Hmm. But you'll notice, for example, in people like both Descartes and Spinoza, how they, they want to deeply integrate insight and inference. If you think about inference as, as pursuing confirmation, and that's what it, right? Insight is hmm. when, right, we, we are trying to, allow reality to realize itself if you'll allow me mm-hmm. and in a way that mm-hmm. penetrates into yes. our in, inferential mm-hmm. fortress yes yeah yeah right yeah and so yeah i don't know if that's totally but i was doing my best to try and bring some science to what guy was saying and, and so i think 
if if you'll allow me one one more thing, I think there's a way in which we can come into relationship like 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 this. Like I'm almost inverting it, uh, the Zen thing. So when I was a child, you know, <laughs> rivers were rivers, right? And then I became an adult and mm -hmm. rivers were rivers, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. But now and Barfield talks about this. Can I get to a place yeah. that's beyond both of those? Mm. Yeah. Can I get yeah. to a place, right? Uh huh. That is Bingo. appropriately characterized Bingo. by insight and metaphor, and in, therefore inherently dialogical. Mm. That that yeah. that's right. And that's where I'm thinking of uh, of Bolte Taylor because she can step to the right, but she she doesn't step to the right in trauma and and is trapped there. Because being trapped in the right hemisphere is really bad, right? She she knew how to how to dialogue between them in order to bring insight yeah. into the inferential. One more point, and this is just as a cognitive science thing. We're getting a, a little too obsessed also about right and left, yeah. right? We have to remember there's three dimensions right. to the yeah. brain. There's back mm -hmm. to front, and that's where general mm -hmm. intelligence is probably found. And then there's there's neuraxial, but there's from the cortex down to the brainstem. And that's where the, a lot of the, the embodiment is found. And all of those yeah. dimensions are at work in what we're talking about here. Yeah. Just, to, just, to, yeah. just to bring that in. Yeah. So this kind of mutual, and it's even in, it's even in this way, I was just thinking about like a couple of things. Vulnerability, mm -hmm. right? And this is what, and in the role of trust, right? That, that, that's, in this op this this openness that it because it's like the in some sense you know i think what people come to circling for right is yeah. is ascent is is essentially right to experience what you can only experience through being a a, a, a kind of openness a radical kind of openness to the other right I, I, hmm? I, yeah I, go, go ahead john go ahead john notion of vulnerability like think about it so if I'm just in the right hemisphere, that's exposure. In fact, yep. the right hemisphere, it, it was largely evolved to deal there with predation, is. right? Ah, yeah. exposure. Yeah. That's the yeah. right hemisphere. That's it's evolutionary heritage. The yes. left yes. hemisphere is everything is boxed in. The familiar, yep. right? Vulnerability yep. is exactly neither one of those. It's to, right? Yeah. Your notion of vulnerability yeah. is, right? This, it's the moving yeah. between them. Right. And so brain, like, so here we start to get into like hypothalamus, amygdala, safety, right? This that kind of notion of this playfulness of the back and forth, what allows you to be, the to, serious to, be play. To, to be vulnerable in the, in the, in this kind of, this sense that what you just, so people know what we're talking about with the sense of um, the distinction between uh, vulnerability and exposure is vulnerability always in, like insinuate um, something that you're volunteering towards, right? You're, you're, you're proactively opening yourself up to the other. Yes. Um, and I was thinking about like, in terms of insight, I keep thinking about this way that um, uh, listening, right? This, this listening is so radically awesome and no one ever really thinks about it. And I'm fucked. I am fascinated by listening, right? What is going on with listening? Because it's, because you usually think about the common sense notion of listening is listening is just the thing that happens if you don't, if you shut up while the other person's talking, right? And that there's a kind of sense where it's like, if you maybe, maybe you just empty yourself out and be quiet. And then you, you get filled up with information or something like oh. that, right? But that's not at all what listening is. Think about it. Listening is, in some sense, is synonymous with a, like a. Um, it, it's it's you can't you can't listen and think at the same time, right? Notice how deeply coupled they are. So if you if you start drifting, having a thought right now as I'm talking, like you'll notice that you stopped listening. So if you think about this, in some sense. I, to truly listen to you, right? I, in some sense, I give over my nose, right? My noose, my mind over to you, right? And, and your language in some sense thinks me, right? I literally have to, under, to understand you. I have to think the thought that you're having. And, and if you think about this, like some thoughts in order to think them, right? Require 
require a different presupposition for me to actually stand yeah. on, yeah. right? Yeah. In order to think that thought, which now that becomes a transformative experience, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this thing that Chris talks about, this kind of at, at some point in Dialogo. So this is happening now where, Sorry, where like where they answer. start to transform. Yes, yes. Where where you start to get this interpenetration where it's like, oh, you can't quite tell if I'm if I'm like it's in some sense, I'm I'm speaking your thinking into into your listening, right? Revealing you, that, that's my the, speech. Yeah. That's, yeah. The, that's the indwelling internalization, like back to the, yes. the scientist with the rovers, right? Yes, yeah. that's, that's totally that's what it is. Yeah. And this is where we just get, I'm just starting to get to get this sense of dialogue, right? And I, thou, and, 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 and dialogos as, as it's in some sense, it's like this, it's like symbolic, right? For the whole thing. <laughs> it's almost I, I, like the I, whole universe I, is just, a symbol. I just want to taste something though. I just want to taste yeah. something. You drew into, for me, you drew in, you drew into connection, logos, indwelling, internalization, and insight in a way that I hadn't thought them together before. Sorry, that's why I'm interrupting. Mm. I just want to pause mm. there. Please, there's please. There's, uh, I, 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 there's nothing more. I don't have, I'm just listening, but uh, sorry, it's an active. Yeah. That I just, I'm, right, I, I right. want, you, you, you drew things together in my mind that I could not draw together in my mind, but then my mind immediately it remembered it as right. If you'll allow me to right. end the word remember, recognized, remembered yes. it. Oh, yes, of course, right? It was that kind of yes. experience. That, yes. that. That I hadn't had, I hadn't drawn those two together that way before. Yeah, I want to. I'm sorry, Listen, thank you. Now I'm hearing what I just. I'm. I'm. He's. <laughs> <laughs> he's. He's thinking my thought through me listening him. Right. There's this right. kind of interpenetration. Right. And that just brought together that exemplifies that. Right. So this kind of this, this radical openness and this deep trust that that comes together, right? And this is where I think the thing about trust in Buber talks about this, that, that there is, because to really give, give yourself over to a dialogue or a conversation, right? Like uh, if you, it, it does seem to be predicated on my ability to let go on some level, right? And really be, uh, be open to be moved by and touched and changed by another, right? This kind of, this, Yes, these interpenetration things. Yes, but I am. I'm starting to. Um, I'm needing to go here pretty soon. We've been going. Yeah, for like, I think this is a good place to going end. on over two hours. <laughs> Rea reality is intervening in a wonderful way. But uh, what I yeah. uh, what I what what I'd like to do is um, maybe we'll reverse order. We'll start with Zevi and give everybody a chance to any sort of final word they want to bring to yeah. our, our dialogue. But before we do that. Um, because I don't want to forget to do this. Uh, this was wonderful. And, and I mean that in both senses of the word. And I <laughs> want to thank both yeah. of you for showing up so powerfully. Um, mm. So, Zevi, yeah. final uh, thoughts or words? We're not done. Yeah. We're going to move to Guy's channel and do the next one. But final yeah. words of today. Yeah, it feels like we're really just getting started. Well, first, yeah. I, want to, I want to return the thank you to, to both Guy and John for for creating the space for dialogue, to creating the space where the reality of each of us can hinge upon the other to reveal that within ourselves yeah. that we weren't yet aware of, um, which is really what this process is. I, I, I was I was sort of stuck in, in something earlier that had come up and I, and I wanna put a pin in that because I'd like to come back to that in future dialogues, which is that Buber puts out these two modes of being, the I, thou, and the, and the I, it. And Walter, and he's, Walter Kaufman, in his, in his famous scathing introduction to, to the new translation of I, thou says, like these aren't the only two modes of being, like what is this like reductionistic dualism? Um, and, and he does it in, in like a very, I think in a very like deflammatory way. It's like, it's not, it's not interesting the way he does it. But I think what, what John was pointing to just there now is that there's a sense that to sort of to, to, to map on these two modes of relationship to the right and left, the child to the adult, to the instrumentalization or the ends in itself, sort of all these parallel themes that we've been drawing here, the sense that one, not, not only do we need both, right? That we can't just be totally living in the eye that we We also need to be buying groceries and, and feeding children. And yeah, um, yeah. so there is not, so not only is there a need for both uh, and not only can we step back into one another as the mode accounts for it and, and the relevance realization of knowing when am I supposed to be 
I thouing, what am I supposed to be I itting, right? When I'm walking through traffic, I don't want to I thou every car in traffic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but more than that, yeah. I want to know, John, you pointed to something which is which is the space where um where 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 it's neither I thou or I it, or it's somehow both of them together. Yeah. It's not yeah. it's not here one and here the other. It's yeah. not here left, here right, here yeah. adult, here child, but it's the sense where the yeah. adult and child come together yeah. as, as, the, yeah. as the adult yeah. can. Yeah. Child and, and adult. And that's, that's I think, a, a, a dialogue between these two modes of existence, which I would be interested yeah. to explore. So in, in place of a recap, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that into the future. A request is also as good as a recap. So yes. let's take note of that and let's, let's, let's pick that up in the next dialogue. Awesome. Yeah, totally. totally. Guy, final uh, so, thought. Yeah, this was, just, this was just ecstatic. This is just ecstatic. This is, this is, um, I feel blessed. Um, and there was, I want to say that this, this felt like real genuine dialogos. Like, yes. um, yeah, very much. And uh, I feel kind of a sense of wholeness and a fullness, like almost overfull. <laughs> My brain's shut off at some, at some point. I can't think any more thoughts, right? But that fullness, that fullness does seem to have something to do. I keep this kind of inner penetration, right? That's something that both reveals something, right? It, it, it reveals something that seemed to be implicit, but it also gestalts into something new and inner penetrates on so many different directions. So I just feel like this whole thing, like a piece of my attention has just continually been into the dialogue that we were actually having and watching it unfold. And I just love those moments where what we're, what we're speaking about is the thing that's speaking, right? Like what, that we're doing the topic that we're speaking about, right? This is, there's something about that that just seems to be, you can hear the logos kind of like become itself in some sense, right? So I really appreciate that. And so, yeah. And so something about, um, and this actually speaks to what you were talking about, uh, Zevi, is the, the, so this, I wanna look at this, I wanna look at this kind of thing about the, like the uh, Heidegger's notion, for, for, so Heidegger and Buber, right? They profoundly come together in a lot of ways and there's some places where they, they disagree, but there's also some place where they actually profoundly agree I think I think Buber starts to get at what 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 is what is auth what is what is di discourse in, in 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 Heidegger's being in time language what is discourse in authenticity right when you're in, where you're in the authentic mode right what is it to talk to one another what would that be right and I think that this is this is this is where Buber really kind of highlights something as as something other than than, than idle talk, which is one of the inauthentic modes of, of, of uh, Dasein in being in time, where right? he talks about just idling speech, just keeping things going, keeping the, the interpretations going, like on some level, like kind of living as if you're not gonna die, right? A kind of fallenness. And then, but he doesn't really go into what is discourse Ah. in the authentic mode right so i right. think this is i think buber criticizes heidegger for that um but i think heidegger i think there's a deep weddedness going on here that just needs to be ex explicified and also there is this other sense too i have to we have to think about this but there is a, this other sense of like what is this we space that people talk about or the collective intelligence right or the distributed cognition yep. like in some sense, we're in, we, we, we're, we are drawing on so many conversations that we've never experienced that in some help we're, we're drawing on, right? There's so many levels of the collective, right, that, that are here. In what way is that a part of all of this, right? Mm -hmm. How do we, what does it mean to draw on it for it to be present, right? Like in, in, and does Buber get at that with I thou or is, or is, or is the we space something different than, than that, right? So I think those are some open questions that I, yeah. I think I'm gonna come in and try, want us to touch on a bit. Great, so yeah. just a reminder um, that 
following up on that, we're, the next installment of this series will be found on Guy's channel. We'll all, all three of us will be there. We'll put links in this video to Guy's channel. Um, and uh, Guy's gonna take the lead in, uh, in that session. Uh, and then thereafter, we will move to, to Zevi's channel. And so um, I, 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 I look forward to this and I encourage uh, all of you to come yeah. along to this ride. I think this is just really wonderful. So thank you very much, Duncan. Uh, so one, one more thing, John. Also, yep. just a reminder, if you're interested in the Dialogos circling course, link for that will be below in the show notes. Yes, for sure. All for right. Sure.